Hi, I'm Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I'm Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They're posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of August 30th, 2022 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us in a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in a moment of silence. <clears throat> Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, Member Washington. We have no withdrawn items today. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Gray and I have a second by Member Perez. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are present. We have two sets of minutes to be approved today, July 26, 2022 school board meeting and August 11, 2022 school board meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Washington and I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format for today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe that all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now read the board guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. The meeting can be viewed with closed caption on live webcasts, on cable TV, and on video monitors here in the auditorium. It also can be viewed with closed caption in online video archive.
Thank you, Member Washington. We have one item scheduled for time certain, and that's 6 o'clock p.m., employee input. We will now move to public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking your time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, the comments are not directly personally against a board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have two minutes. Rem reminder that your two minutes start when you begin speaking. When there are 30 seconds left, you will see a yellow light on the lectern, a red light, and a chime will indicate when your time is up. I will now call up the first speakers. If the first five speakers will uh, line up against the wall, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Paula Castano. Dr. Emil Freirach, Freireich had no patience and a volcanic temper. He was also extremely dedicated and brilliant. No one understood him and categorized him as flippant and uncouth. Dr. Freireich thought outside the typical paradigm of thinking. He came up with ideas that no one agreed with and saved millions of children from leukemia at a time when children would bleed out from the disease. The doctor who was fired from almost every job he took, to this day is still credited as the father of modern leukemia, leukemia therapy. Chair Combs, Vice Chair Washington, board members, please be like Dr. Freireich. Ignore the petulant voices surrounding you. Find a way to pay teachers and all personnel for years of experience they have earned. Maybe I already should not have been renewed. Maybe some consultants should not have been hired. Think carefully when you receive the consent agenda. Keep thinking ahead to streamline the budget and help all educational personnel to stay in the field. The battle for our district will continue. Our schools are being defunded. I know I say that every meeting, but they are. The state has an agenda, and with the greatest surplus to date, it's almost $22 billion the state has. They're still starving our schools. Can you think outside the box like Dr. Freireich and get us a game plan to save hundreds of thousands of children in our district? I believe you can. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, James Castano, Hillsborough Public School Ad Advocates. Uh, good afternoon. I'm a uh, disabled veteran, a Republican, conservative, and a minority, and a Christian. We attend Mass every Sunday. I voted for Governor DeSantis, but I'm disgusted at what seems to be a bipartisan effort to destroy a public school system. The key players involved are trying to dismantle our public education in the state of Florida and our country to include the Ford, former Education Commissioner, Mr. Corcoran, who is also the authorizer of all charter schools in the state, Larry Aaron, Betsy DeVos, and others are waging a political war at our expense, at the expense of our public schools, and using an ideolo ideological-based version of a curriculum instead of a curriculum-based model as, uh, as a way to defend, uh, to defund our public schools and drive our Florida teachers away, which will lead to an increase in the creation of substandard education alternatives. I believe in our public schools, our Magnets IB program, private schools, which I attended both public and private schools, and homeschooling. I will not be silent as they cripple our public schools and attend uh, the, the, uh, the public schools I intended, to include Mayor Castor, Governor Ron DeSantis, a lot of people in this room, and many people on the DS right here attended our public schools in Hillsborough County. The state of Florida is trying to starve our public schools. 
our teachers at the expense of all the kids in Florida, including my own two who go to Grady Elementary, and the taxpayer and defraud the taxpayer. I support funding our police, our military, which I've served in both, and our public schools. Shouldn't be any different. Addison and the board, please find the money to pay our teachers and school personnel now and in the future. Oh, I'm out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. My name is Kim Prezkop. I'm involved with public school students in South Shore through my Kiwanis Club in Sun City Center. Recently, I met a fellow Kiwanian with a passion for placing the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence into the hands of every child. I felt compelled to come here today and tell his story, especially after learning that Governor DeSantis recently began a civics initiative for all seventh graders. My friend's name is Joseph Cofield, a career army man and social studies teacher for 15 years in Pinellas County. He earned eight prestigious awards for teaching and community service. Joseph also earned a Master of Arts in History from the Florida Gulf Coast University. This allowed him to be a master teacher of the Constitution. In the years since his vision in 2007, Joseph never gave up. He started a nonprofit, Constitution for the People. And in 2016, the Constitution book was published. It's a booklet. Inside the booklet are copies of the Constitution, the amendments, the declaration, 27 fill-in-the-blank questions with answers, two discussion questions, famous quotes by our famous founding fathers and others, a list of the signers of the declaration by state, and an index, all in just 46 pages. Everyone can take it home. Everyone in the home can learn from it. How wonderful if non-citizens were to decide to become U.S. citizens after reading it. The words are certainly inspirational. Board members, Pinellas and Manatee County already have this booklet in their fifth grade classes. It's up to us to get it in Hillsborough County students' classes. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I would like to thank Superintendent Addison Davis and some of the school board members that intentionally checked up on me. I'm blessed and grateful. A safe space was created for your employees to speak freely about what's happening at their school sites without retaliation. Reading the comments posted by your employees should frustrate you, it should alarm you, and it should move you to take action. Each of you was provided a folder to read the receipts for yourself. Enclosed are comments and pictures of unsafe working conditions, including pest infestations, health code violations, and overcrowded classrooms that lack AC, textbooks, and access to technology. As the seventh largest school district in the nation and the third largest in the state, this district holds the power to influence other school districts to fight back against the unfunded mandates and the policies that contribute to the dismantling of public education. As a formal employee of this district, it breaks my heart to see what's happening to the employees and our children. Our most vulnerable children are suffering, suffering, and for what? This district has a history of making promises that they do not keep. This district has a history of putting the needs of adults before the needs of children. This district seems to be more concerned with protecting its image than it is protecting its employees and preparing students for life. It's time for change. Stand up to the state legislature and fight against the harmful policies and inadequate funding that are contributing to the dismantling of public education. It's time to take the power back. It's time to put students and staff 
first. It's time to invest in those who have accepted the calling to cultivate the future leaders of our nation. It's time to fight against the war in education and actually be in the business of educating. Our children are worth fighting for. Our employees are worth fighting for. Public education is worth fighting for. Please be intentional with the power you have and fight back. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And if the next five speakers would line up, thank you. Um, I do want to give a parental advisory before I start. My name is Alyssa and I'm with Moms for Liberty. Here's my question. I hope to get some sort of answers here since I've received few responses through my many emails. Um, anyone here recently read the Florida Statutes and School Board Members Obligations, Section 1006.28, Part 2? Each district school board is responsible for the content of all the instructional material and any other material used in a classroom made available in the school library and including a reading list. Based on this statute, as a school board members, you are in fact responsible for the books and media that are in our schools. So then why is there that none of you have made any efforts to vet these very pornographic books in our schools? Please explain to me why none of you have any issue with blowjobs, anal sex, masturbation, sex toys, hand jobs, and pedophilia, just to name a few topics that are accessible to our children. The fact that there's so much pushback from you who we voted into your position to protect our children is appalling. Have you ever searched for sex instruction for children in our Hillsborough County Public School Library catalog? Because I have, and what I found was, should bring major concerns and question to any parent. Search for sex instructions for children. Catalogs show that pops up as a genre, genre that has 20 books through, spread throughout many copies in our schools. I'm sorry, but I refuse to accept the reason for these books to be available to our children in public school libraries because it accommodates the need of our community. Who in our community needs our children to go make a sex app profile to meet up with local strangers for sex? Why are we accommodating these pedophiles? Is it maybe the groomers who are placing these books on our shelves, or is it the indoctrinating system who sit up on a podium and allow these books to be given to our children? What is the need you people have to teach our children how to give the proper blow job without using your teeth? Or the timeless classic, the handy. Why children need to know how to properly clean their butt before partaking in anal sex. We have over 300 schools in our district. Thank We've you. been told. Next speaker, please. There are children in this room right now, so you're contributing yourself. Yes, I'm Next speaker, please. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Gay Jones. Um, a popular author and cultural critic named James Lindsay recently created a Twitter post that featured pictures from a book that my friend Julie read at the July the 12th board meeting that was entitled, This Book is Gay. Lindsay's post, calling out the Hillsborough County School Board, was catchily headlined, quote, I told you they were groomers, end quote, followed by, and I quote, Hillsborough County Middle School Library has a book graphically detailing how to have gay sex and use the gay hookup app grinder using the kid-friendly language like blowy and bumming, end quote. Lindsay finished this with, quote, this is literally what grooming kids for sex looks like, end quote. Twitter outing itself as a champion of child sexualization permanently banned Mr. Lindsay for a subsequent incident. This particular post, however, had had over 300 shares before its removal and is currently spreading and generating ire on other platforms. One of the post's photos features a comparatively mild instructional passage, quote, as with hand jobs and breakfast eggs, all men like their blow jobs served in different ways, end quote. And you want children reading that. In closing, I quote H. Patakis, you became tolerant of their degeneracy only for them to become intolerant of your values. You pretended they were your equal only for them to tell you they were your superiors. There's no greater myth than the proposition of an amicable coexistence between opposing cultures. You can either conform to those who are wielding power or you can take power back. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, 
Hi. <clears throat> My name is Christina Edwards, and I have two children in the public school system. Last year, I spoke to this board about the concerns I had with Panorama Education, conducting surveys on public school children without parents' knowledge or consent. In case you don't remember, I discussed that Panorama Education has been criticized for inserting race, critical race theory into curriculum across the country. Their mission statement is clearly identified on their website. We strongly denounce racism. We are committed to fighting against it. We commit to dismantling system, systemic racism. We commit to embodying and spreading anti-racism practices. And we commit to building systems of opportunity and possibility for students of color. Furthermore, Panorama Education is personally connected to the Attorney General who directed the FBI to target parents who protest CRT training at school board meetings. When I was done speaking, I was quickly ushered out of the boardroom by, I believe, Mr. McCauley, the Chief of Staff. He took notes about my concerns, received my contact information, and promised to follow up with me, but I never heard anything. Since that board meeting, my seventh grader received an assignment asking him to describe three ways he could fight racism today. And my sixth grader has received a syllabus informing me that social emotional learning will be taught in school between November 14th and December 16th. On the agenda today, I see that Panorama Education is up for renewal of services. Within a contract is a billing schedule outlining the deliverable services, which include the con continuation of student and teacher surveys, along with in-person professional development workshops and resources for school le leaders. This means that education, educators receive access to Panorama's professional learning community and educational resource libraries. So I'm just going to leave you with one question. Why is the district considering spending another $362.5 million on an education platform created to data Thank mine you. our kids' Next speaker, please. and push critical race Thank you. Theory? Next speaker, please. My name is John Rutledge. My daughter is a student at Strawberry Crest High School. We've submitted an official request for my daughter to bring her service dog to school, which has been denied. I've outlined the, nat the nature of the disability and the two tasks the dog performs to aid this disability <clears throat> excuse me, in the original request. Florida Statute 413.08 defines the service animal as an animal that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of an individual with a disability, including a physical, psychology, psychology, psychiatric, intellectual, or other mental disability. I believe the district personnel who made the decision to deny this service animal genuinely does not understand the difference between an emotional support animal and a service dog, and that service dogs are required public access by law. Per the ADA, a public accommodation or facility is not allowed to ask for documentation or proof that the animal has been trained, certified, or licensed as a service animal. Additionally, I would like to ask the district why the principal at Strawberry Crest is being advised not to follow, follow the scoreboard written policy, which is 8390. The policy states, the principal will be responsible for determining whether the required documentation has been provided for the student's service animal. When the required documentation has been provided, the principal will determine if the service animal will be permitted to accompany the student with the disability anywhere on the campus. Why is the district safety office responsible for approving, denying the service animal request when they are not the principal at the school? Who is advising the principal not to follow policy 8390? I'm in seeking an immediate relief as my daughter is being damaged by the denial of her civil rights under the Federal American Disability Act Title II law. I hope the elected officials here today will hear the story of my daughter, understand the gravity in the situation. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And if the next five speakers would line up against the wall, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christina Rutledge, and I'm also here um, to request that each person on this board and Mr. Davis Please direct the employees of Hillsborough County Public Schools to follow the federal ADA Title II law and approve the service dog request that we made for our child four months ago. 
My child has a 4.0 GPA in the IB program at Strawberry Crest. She suffers from a disability. At the recommendation of medical professionals, she received a service dog. Her disability severely limits her, abil her ability to function in her day-to-day -day life. After starting to work with her service dog last year, we saw major improvements in our daughter and in her quality of life. I followed the district pro protocol back in May to request permission for her to attend school this fall with her service dog. By summer, my child was using her service dog exclusively to manage her disability and was living a somewhat normal life for the first time in about three years. Despite submitting the proper request, the district is continuing to deny her service dog access at school. The district is violating ADA Title II law. Everyone here has received copies of our request and continues to remain silent while the welfare of my child is at stake. Every single day, my child must now choose between effectively managing her disability and going to school. How is this a free and appropriate education? She has regressed significantly. This past week, she missed class more than once due to her disability. After the denial, the district has made zero effort to gather more information, put in any procedures in place to support my child or even check on her. Why is no one offering her a 504 accommodation or a copy of my parental rights? Also, I have spoken to the legal office. They are now requesting proof of training for the service dog that does not exist. Per, there is no state or federal uh, training for service dogs or certification that we can provide. It is not the district's right to determine if a, if a service animal is medically necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Allison Fernandez. I am here to talk about the budget and finance. So you all realize that the tax request did not pass. And I would like to say to you that it is because the public, while they support public education, they support teachers, do not trust you to spend their money wisely. I suggest that you give a very hard scrutiny to the budget and the spending that you have. Because right now, and this is information from your CFO, I did not make it up. Your budget, your general fund budget is 89 to 90% payroll, personnel. That is excessive. That means if you are right-sized or undersized at your school sites, there is only one place that you can be overspending on payroll, and it is at the district level. That means that you have too many high-paid district officials if you are not able to pay your teachers appropriately is because you are not allocating funds appropriately. I am an accountant. If you come to me and show me and build the cost of educating a student at an elementary, middle school, and high school, I will support and lobby those efforts to say we need X dollars of funding. But you don't do that. You just come to the taxpayer and ask for more money. Meanwhile, you're paying for Panorama, which many parents object to. I don't want my son uh, to be surveyed on emotional and basically relationship questions behind my back. That's, those are for our family to decide and discuss. Um, fortunately, my son's 17, so he doesn't actually answer any of the questions appropriately because he's, he's a high schooler. Uh, so you won't very, get very good information out of him. But uh, again, stop spending money on things that don't actually contribute to adequate reading and writing and arithmetic. That's what children need to know. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, board, um, staff members, and public. My name is Tina Williams Brewster. Hi again. I'm here to talk about, I'm so glad I was able to come right after those two speakers. Ties in beautifully with my topic, IEP accommodations and 504. Once again, the taxpayers have spoken. Are you listening? You're too top heavy as the accountant said. As a parent, I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't vote for the millage. Do you wanna know why? My daughter who has an IEP, it's the law. Her accommodations aren't being followed. I've written letters, I've had informal meetings, I've had formal meetings, I've had IEP meetings. Some of you have, I've spoken to personally. I've gone, how many years have I been fighting now? Seven years. New school, 
same system, but yet you ask me to pay for this. I cannot, as a parent, as a taxpayer, I cannot feel okay and be comfortable continuing to pay for a lack of education. The new curriculum you said, I have three different students. This will be my sixth student in Hillsborough County. He still doesn't have a teacher. Go into the classrooms, they say. I'm sorry, there's some teachers that they just aren't equipped to be in the classroom. Do better. Look at your budget and really decide why does a school need four or five and six admin? Some of them who don't even know me or they claim not to. It's time to do the work. The taxpayers have spoken. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Alan Brewster, board member superintendent. I have a daughter who's just started Gaither High School. She came home and saying, Mom and Dad, the classroom I'm in is hot, no heat, no air for a whole week. I called the principal three times, didn't respond. So I told him, if you don't call me back today, I'm calling the chief of schools. He called me back. He claimed he didn't know about the issue. My point is this, why should a teacher or a student have to be subjected a whole week in a room that's 90 degrees with no alternative plan to move them? That is a health risk. That's, it's unacceptable. Where's the fail safe? Where is it? This is the principal. I called three times. He sent his agents to call my wife. My wife didn't call. I call. So you didn't want to deal with the parent. That's the message that I'm getting. Jefferson High School, the ACP there, the APC there is ineffective. Ineffective. I'm telling you right now, she is ineffective. She's giving my daughter, she's a, a senior there, classes that she don't need. And now she's suffering and they don't have a plan to help her. They want to take her out of the data class and put her back into an algebra class. And if she does that, she loses a bright scholarship. Turkeys making turkey decisions. That's ineffective. That's this leadership. The school district is operating upside down. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Superintendent Davis and members of the board. My name is Alexis Frugier, and I'm the proud PTA president for Carrollwood Elementary School. I would like to speak today about transitioning Carrollwood Elementary into Carrollwood K-8. I'm aware that you are receiving emails from our community members who are in support of this initiative, telling their own personal stories about why this transition is so desperately needed. We have families that have made significant life decisions and changes based on where their children will go to middle school, such as moving out of the school boundaries, sometimes even out of our district, staying in the district and acquiring the soaring costs of private school tuition, spending hours in the car driving kids to charter, private, and other choice school options out of our neighborhood, and most alarming, eliminating our amazing elementary school altogether and turning to K-8 schools to secure a seat for middle school. But from your perspective, why is this initiative so needed? Each year, fewer Carrollwood families attend our zoned middle school. For this school year, there were only two students out of 106 that enrolled in sixth grade at our zoned middle school. That number is staggering. Many families are choosing to move to private and or charter schools in grades three and four, even earlier, to secure a seat in a K-8 environment. With that move, the district loses valuable FTE funding as well as teacher units, which is what happened at our school today with the loss of one of our phenomenal teachers. 
I can't help but think we wouldn't be losing teachers if we had this K-8 option. Families will not enroll their children in a D-rated middle school after attending an A-rated elementary school and will continue to make choices outside of their zone schools. Superintendent Davis, as we have seen your leadership tackle unforeseen challenges during the previous two years, we know with your support, this initiative can be accomplished. However, we yeah. must act now to make Thank this- Thank you, next speaker, please. For the 2023 <laughs> school year. Thank you. Hello, I am Danielle Eichmann. The next thing we wanna address with you is the cost on becoming a K-8. We know it would not be fiscally responsible for the district to fund a new K-8. So the question is, how do we do this with little to no cost to the district? Our goal is a class size of 100 to 110 students per grade. At this size, the FTE funding provided will support the teachers and materials for our site. We are not asking for an additional building. Carewood has enough rooms to make this happen, resulting in no construction costs. As seen with Maniscalco, this can be done with very little additional funding by using additional resources that are available within the district. Materials and furniture are available at other middle schools where there are unfilled seats. These items can be transferred to Carewood, resulting in no material costs. All middle school seats are choice seats, requiring parents to provide transportation, so there will be no transportation costs. Each year, the reduced number of choice students in grades K-5 will balance the increase in choice students in grades 6 through 8. There will be an equal number of teachers needed to fill positions, leaving us with no new teacher costs. Students returning or staying in the district instead of attending charter or private schools is a gain in FTE dollars for the district. And lastly, we have a large community support behind us. Our PTA is prepared to give an in-kind donation to help cover potential costs that could arise. Last school year, we raised approximately $50,000. Here today, we have a small representation of a very large group of supporters for this initiative. As you continue to hear from us, I would like to remind you that we need a decision maker to agree to add grade six for school year 23-24. We need you to agree to come alongside with us and make a prompt decision for our community and for our district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Danielle. My name is Brittany Cooper, and I am both a proud parent of several Carrollwood Owls, but also a proud alumni of Carrollwood Elementary. I grew up in the neighborhood and have returned to raise my own family here. I get the opportunity to talk to you why community matters in this during this conversation. We are public school supporters, and we support everything you do. What we represent is a whole community of concerned residents that are looking to bring pride back to our public schools. Last Tuesday during the primary elections, we received more than 450 signatures on a petition in favor of making Carrollwood a K-8. The point is our community cares. We fundraise, we, pe we back petitions, petitions, we show up to vote every time there is an opportunity. They know that the home values are directly correlated to the school grades. This is important for you when you're running for re-election. Our community can and will support the members of the school board that have the best interests of our schools at the forefront of their decision making. We are aware of the importance of strong public school education options for our families. While we are fortunate enough to live in a neighborhood where Carrot Elementary is a long-standing, thriving, and boasts an A grade, our current zoned middle school is not an option for the families that we're willing to explore at all. Schools like Carrollwood bring connection through community. Even though Carrollwood has unmatched community connection, this is being lost as families scatter for middle schools. We know because we are all facing that decision today. With your help, we will transition Carrollwood to a K-8 school, and we will gain pride in our public school middle school options again. We need a decision maker to add grade six for the next school year, 2023, 2024. This means deciding to act now and plan thoughtfully during this current school year. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
My name is Raquel Pilaro. I'm a King High School alumni and a daughter of a former USF professor, Dean of the School of Education at BGSU, and President of the National Association for the Education of Young Children. So it comes as no surprise that I am a lifelong advocate and supporter of public education for our children. This afternoon, I want to explain some of the nuts and bolts of how this is going to get started. Carrollwood will add one grade per year, starting with grade six in August 2023. Following that will be grade seven in 2024 and grade eight in 2025. For each grade, we will need three to four classrooms to support the students. Our plan calls for balancing the number of students in the school by limiting the number of choice seats in grades K through 5. Those seats will be reallocated to grades K through 8. This will not affect the school capacity, and we're not asking to exceed fish capacity. With the addition of one grade at a time, this will allow the district to modify choice slots to give priority to our Carrollwood rising sixth grade students. This does not impact students who are already choiced in, but will limit future enrollments. Our target enrollment will be 100 to 110 students per grade level. At that number, the unit is paid for by the kids in the seats. We do understand there will be a consultant and a rezoning. While this is great news for the district, this does not impact our ask to make Carrollwood a K through eight school. We do not have time to wait for the results. At the end of this school year, you will lose 98% of Carrollwood fifth grade students to another school, private, charter, Florida virtual or magnet, and they will not return for high school in the district. We need your help. Superintendent Davis and members of the school board, this is what we are asking of you today. No one can do it alone. We cannot do it alone. And we need the path to the expeditious decision today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Jenna Malassi. I was a former kindergarten teacher here in the district and a long-term sub. My husband and I own a small business together and he also works a full-time job. Today I'm going to address the teacher aspect. Today Carrollwood Elementary lost a wonderful fifth grade teacher because most students are pulling out in third through fifth grade when they get into a charter or private school. By making Carrollwood a K-8, we can keep these kids at our school and keep our teachers employed. Teachers want to be employed at an A school. In our model for teachers, this reallocation of choice seats results in an equal number of teachers lost and gained. There will not be an additional number of teachers needed to fill positions at Carrollwood K-8. Like every other year, units from other middle schools like Ben Hill can be moved where students are going. Additional FTE funding will come with students who aren't currently choosing schools within the district. Carrollwood is a desirable school to work at. We have a low number of teacher turnover. This is a win for the district. We also have several current teachers who are certified to teach sixth through eighth grade and have expressed excitement in the opportunity to do so at Carrollwood K-8. Please, please, we beg of you, make a decision to make Carrollwood Elementary a K-8 right away. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Jenna. My name is Krista Mills, and my husband Jared and I are the committee chairs for the Carrollwood PTA K-8 initiative. I want to start off by thanking you for meeting with us on September 7th to discuss Carrollwood becoming K-8. Please make sure that the decision maker is there. We will be back here to follow up with y'all to let you guys know how that meeting went. Superintendent Davis, as we have seen with other policies, anything that you want to get done can be done. We know that you want to see graduation rates increase across the county. You want to see the metrics that, that support this. What we are proposing is going to support your increased graduation rates. It is going to cause a trickle up effect, causing students to remain in the public school system where they will naturally feed into Chamberlain. Currently, the district, Chamberlain staff, and alumni are working hard to support gains being made at Chamberlain. This is incredible, but they won't reach their full potential if they don't have an A-rated middle school that will bridge the kids from elementary to high. You need a middle school win. You need a middle school that fills its seats, that maintains an A-grade, that has a community. 
Prior to COVID, several elementary schools in our district successfully transitioned to a K-8 model. This model is in response to student needs and is an attempt to recapture and retain students leaving for other school options. It will allow students to be provided a middle school option in our local community. Maniscalco K-8 had the highest learning gains in the county last year with this model, and we would like to the district's help to follow in their footsteps. I encourage you all to consider our plan in detail. Carrollwood families are in fierce support of this change and need action to make it happen. My husband, Jared, is also on the board for our, our neighborhood. He cares deeply about our community. He pulled the graduation announcements for the prior eight years. We had more kids going to private schools or home schools than we did public schools. And of the public schools, Steinbrenner, Gaither, Hillsborough IB, and any number of other schools were more common than Chamberlain. School board, we need you to get behind this and help us make a decision for next school year. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Wynn, and I am a uh, resident of the Carrollwood area for the past 20 years, and I also work in Carrollwood. I'm a parent of three Hillsborough County students. Two of them are high schoolers at Hillsborough High IB, and one is currently a third grader at Carrollwood. Back when my older kids were owls at Carrollwood, which was over six years ago, I was concerned about where to send them for middle school. It was a big topic of discussion amongst all of the fourth and fifth grade parents um, back then as it was as it is now. An overwhelming majority were choosing to send their children to schools outside of the community for various reasons. We had to drive over 30 minutes outside of our neighborhood every morning and every afternoon through traffic to and from another Hillsborough County Middle School. Once we got there, we had to wait in a car line behind dozens and dozens of other cars, making the whole process just stressful and even longer than it should be. Although it was difficult to deal with the commute and getting to work on time on a daily basis, we really didn't feel that we had a suitable option closer to home, so we had to somehow make it work. We did this so that our kids could receive an education that at least matched the A standard of what we were used to at Carrollwood Elementary. By having a middle school option right in our neighborhood, it would surely reduce the traffic in our surrounding areas, as well as the tremendous stress of trying to get everyone where they need to go and on time every morning. My family and I support 100% the Carrollwood K-8 initiative. My youngest child is, will be in sixth grade in just a few short years. We would love to have the option of continuing to stay at Carrollwood for the convenience, for its exceptional efforts in maintaining their A rating, and for the remarkable families that make our community so great to be a part of. Please make the decision to make Carrollwood Elementary into a K-8 school. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, school board members, Superintendent Davis and staff. I'm Dr. Anna Brown, and I'm here to conclude today's presentations regarding the Carrollwood K-8 initiative. As you have seen today, this initiative is led by a group of dedicated and knowledgeable individuals who bring to you more than just a request for consideration. This group has spent a great deal of time to bring forward a fully formed solution that satisfies all questions up front. This group now requires next steps and action items that will lead toward a very timely decision to move forward with grade six for the coming 23-24 school year. In summary, just remind you, no construction costs, no transportation costs, no boundary change needed, no additional teaching units needed. Actually, the gain is FTE recaptured coming back to our district. So the looming question is, why wouldn't this get an approval to move forward when all the big ticket items are covered? If questions exist about the how to get this done, simply look at the transition plans for Lutz and Maniscalco K-8 as they have very successfully transitioned. Additionally, know that the Carrollwood community is also very interested in maintaining and supports for our access and self-contained VE students throughout their K-8 years. Continuity for this group of students is critical and also reduces district costs for rerouting transportation to a new site. Mr. Davis, we speak directly to you. Recent history reveals that if you are in favor of a particular transition, it does become reality and it will move forward. Knowing this, we respectfully ask that this group be given full attention and move beyond being on the radar. Let's not let this opportunity pass simply with polite promises to review and consider. 
Action is needed now so that we can get the bell schedule approved, so that units can be allocated a timely. All of those things have a timeline in the district and we all know it, that's why we're asking for a decision now. Families are making this decision for sixth graders next year, and I myself find myself in the position of making this very difficult decision. So as I walk away, do you see dollar signs coming in or leaving? Thank you. Next Thank speaker, you. please. If the next five speakers would please line up, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patricia Hall, and way to go, Carol Wood. <laughs> Due to the short-sighted voters who barely defeated the millage referendum, I am here to support my elected school board members who now have to find 600 plus teachers to lead classrooms full of eager learners. While King, Ronald DeSantis, sits on a $21.8 billion reserve in the Florida budget, we struggle to keep money flowing where it is needed for education. Last I checked, Florida is still a democracy with a governor suspending and eliminating elected officials. Who's next? Broward County, strongly Democratic, now has a Republican school board after King Ronald dismissed four women and installed four men who will take his conservative orders. His voice was on my phone twice before the election last week asking me to vote for unnamed conservative candidates. Was he violating the law? Aren't you all nonpartisan? Supposed to be. I have heard from a former teacher colleague that teachers haven't seen a step increase in three years. They're making less this year than last. DeSantis's dishonest TV commercials sounds like he's given all teachers record raises. He lies. How long will you keep employees when they can work in all surrounding counties for more money? There is no millage. The no millage voters don't realize property values go down when the public school education system is not supported and valued. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Will Witt, and I'm here to really ask what is wrong with Hillsborough County Public Schools that they would allow such a book like This is a Book That's Gay in their schools. I mean, if you look at what's happening in this book, it is pornographic. If kids go online, they are not allowed to watch porn. Uh, it is illegal for them to do so. The kids at these schools are 11 to 13 years old, and it is encouraging them to go on the dating site Grinder. You guys, what I mean, the world that you live in, you know what Grinder is. It is not just a place where you go and meet other people. It is a gay sex app, and you are encouraging children to go onto that app and engage in these sexual activities. You are opening them up to sexual predators, and you are opening them up to grooming. And so what I'm here to say is that there are no excuses for having a book like this in classrooms at schools here in Florida. It is evil, and there really are no excuses. Your guys' job, what you are supposed to do, is to protect children, not expose them to pornographic material, disgusting, vulgar material. And so I ask you what to do is to do your job and not to sexualize and indoctrinate children. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. You spend millions of tax dollars on education technologies. These companies track, surveil, and sell so-called anonymized data on children and collect more data than required under law. A teacher told her child last week that paper tests are an unfair advantage. You put all students at a disadvantage with your high-tech learning facade, and you know it. Thoughtless adherence to the latest and greatest shiny thing it's great until you know the truth. Year after year, my children face harassment, intimidation, and public exclusion by teachers or admin for standing up for their rights. You put grades, assignments, instructions, club sports, and more behind paywalls. You are not a private company. You don't get to install paywalls for access to public education. The payment, our data, and our privacy. You don't have a right to force our children to use ed tech platforms that collect data not required under law or force us to agree to their terms of use. We do not agree to trade our personal liberty or constitutional right of privacy for access to public education. 
I filed a federal complaint against this district when it refused to show us the data it collected on our children. We were blocked from seeing or validating that data. How on earth is the 1970s era federal privacy law, FERPA, written when the internet was new, even remotely effective at protecting your kids' student data? The answer, it isn't. We have a constitutional right of privacy from government intrusion into our private lives. We have parental rights that include opting out of data collection not required under law. EdTech platforms offer literal assurance student data will not be hacked or ransomed. The EdTech industry is under intense scrutiny due to the many who have failed to protect student data. Illuminate Education was just booted from the Student Privacy Pledge for this reason. Tools like Canvas maintain terms of use that tell you not to use the platform if you don't agree to their policies. We don't agree, Thank so you. we're not logging Thank onto the platform. Speaker, please. Our Thank liberty you. and privacy please rights will speaker. not be taken. Pablo, please turn it off. Next five speakers, please line up. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Gebhards. Um, Emily Drabinski is the president-elect of the American Library Association. Drabinski supports drag queen events. She is an avowed Marxist and is pushing for the queering of all libraries. Queering is a term that means pushing back against anything quote unquote normal, like say the protection of childhood innocence, which has been normal for like ever. Academic papers have been written in favor of the destruction of childhood innocence, calling it a culturally created idea, as if the idea of innocence was just made up by someone. Hard to believe, but not really because the evidence of this destruction is everywhere in Hillsborough County School Libraries. Take for instance, This Book is Gay, you've heard about that one today, which I brought to you July 12th at minute marker 1345. This book teaches middle schoolers a step-by-step -step process, as you've also heard today, about how to use Grindr, a sex app. Page 157 says this about it, the benefits are obvious, quick, easy, and uncomplicated sex, unquote. For middle school, the app uses your location to find homosexual partners for you, as detailed in the five steps in the book. This is outrageous. Okay, so why was I talking about the American Library Association? Well, because their standards are posted, uh, because our district has the ALA standards posted all over our website, including the book challenge process. So again, let me remind you, an avowed Marxist is a president-elect of this association. I've gotten emails from you referring to the ALA. Um, Okay, so they have talking points that have also been used from this dais multiple times. Another point made repeatedly from this dais is, and from the media specialist that I spoke with, is this. Books are chosen based on the needs of the community. Wow. Let that sink in for a minute. Grinder, instructions for how to have sex, that's actually horrifying. Horrifying. Parents of this great state of Florida will not stand for this. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker. Hi. First of all, I just want to say it seems like you guys don't actually have kids in this county because it's really easy to get a book removed from the library. You just talk to the librarian and usually there's like a parent board and you can pull it out and if parents agree with you, they'll be like, oh, that's terrible. Let's take it out. It's really easy. So you guys are like not from around here, but I'm a real parent. And I have actual kids in this school system in Hillsborough County. And I'm here to stand with the teachers because I know they're at a breaking point. They're on the front lines of culture wars, screen addiction, information overload, and are expected with no instructions to teach a completely new type of student and figure out a new type of parent relationship, all while being paid essentially less than they were a decade ago. A decade ago, students had never seen TikTok they didn't stare into screens late at night. Parents didn't expect weekly updates or expect to have questions from home answered within hours. Just a few years ago, teachers weren't being blamed on social media for everything. And politicians and fake grassroots groups weren't insulting teachers in the news. Teachers are being paid like iPhones don't exist, like political games don't exist, and like they aren't competing with the entire internet for kids' attention and respect. Our public education millage allocation hasn't increased since 2012, and we're 45th in Florida in per pupil spending funding. Yet, our county has some of the hardest working teachers in the state of Florida, 
and this is not right. As the seventh largest district in the country, we have no excuse to let this continue. Let's do whatever it takes to have teachers who are respected, well-paid, and happy teaching. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I'm here today to bring visibility to an issue that my family and I have been facing since June. I stand here before you advocating for my daughter and any other student who may face this issue in the future. My daughter was a Sumner High School varsity cheerleader as a freshman in 2021. She is a principal's honor roll student and an athlete. At cheer tryouts held in June of this year, my daughter was not chosen for either the JV or varsity team. This decision was made by the previous coach, Madison Wilkie. I questioned the reasoning behind the dismissal with the athletic director, Mr. Melvin Williams. After the new coaches were brought in this summer, they placed my daughter on JV. This was still not satisfactory to my daughter or our family. After further advocacy and escalation, my daughter was placed on the varsity cheer team as an alternate. She has also been selected to be on the Sumner varsity competition team. She was able to cheer on the varsity team this past Friday, but there are no guarantee that she will cheer in any other games. I want to note that I am not here looking for favor. I am looking for the administration to right a wrong. How does a student who has mastered a round off triple back handspring, back handspring step out, standing three back handspring, toe touch back handspring, just to name a few, be ousted unfairly for the varsity team for this school year while simultaneously being selected for the varsity competition team? How is she qualified to compete and represent something in high school against other schools in the district but not qualified to be given a spot on sideline cheer? The regional superintendent, Owa Young, and deputy director, school, chief of schools, Ken Hart, said that I am doing a great job advocating on her behalf. While I appreciate the compliments, I'm not looking for a, I'm looking for a just resolution and, not, and a change in the unfair execution of the current policies and procedures in Sumner High School athletic program. I want to thank Tammy Schamberger for being a champion for our children. I'm calling for the superintendent, Addison Davis, to conduct a full investiga equitable investigation and to recognize that these unjust actions are not only Thank affecting you. my daughter, but Thank any you. other Next student speaker, please. at Sumner High School. Thank you. Thank Next you. speaker, please. Good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of my daughter and other students who are involved in the Cheerbrook program at Sumner High School. Although I haven't been active in the meeting process, I have played a major role in comforting my daughter who's dealt with so much this past summer and beginning of the school year. Being a principal honor roll student and an athlete, I worry about how much mental anguish she will have to endure until this process is over. Not being chosen for a spot you rightfully deserve is a lot of weight to bear for a 15-year-old. Not to mention the questioning and, every, and everything kids may say amongst each other in a school setting. My daughter has had to deal with an embarrassing feat not being able to cheer for a team she practiced night and day to be a part of. I've witnessed her personality change as a result of this unethical process, and I only want my daughter to be happy at the end of this ordeal. As a ninth grader, she made varsity cheer. The very next year, she doesn't make varsity nor JV. She didn't deserve to spend her whole summer fighting for a spot that she just a year before stood out on and did amazingly well. With this issue, when this issue is resolved, I would like for the upcoming years of judging any cheer program to be met with professionalism and integrity. I feel like this year has put a lot of strain on not only my daughter, but her friends as well, who also want to know what happened with this process. We have a lot of unanswered questions and only want to get to the bottom of this. As a father, we want to protect our daughters, and I feel helpless because the school is not acting in the best interest of the kids. I challenge this board to correct this and make this right as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And if the next five speakers would please line up. Good afternoon. My name is Linnea Baker, and I'm here to talk about a recent experience I had. Go and talk to anyone you want to talk to, but this will just come back to my desk. If the parents are so concerned about your daughter, then let them give up their child's spot on the team to your daughter. These are some disparaging comments made by Sumner Athletic Director Melvin Williams to a concerned parent. This is the response he made even when other parents called and sent in letters of concern on behalf of the student. Since the issue has been stewing at Sumner since last June, and after the grievance letter was written, installed by the process, a meeting was scheduled last 
week at Sumner High School. The meeting was from 2 to 3 p.m. The attendees were the principal, athletic director, regional superintendent, deputy chief of schools, a concerned parent, and myself. During the meeting, I brought up the fact that this has been pending since June and still no favorable resolution has been found. I mentioned these comments and said that it showed a lack of leadership. At this time, the athletic director very loud and aggressively said, you don't know me, you don't know me. And Ken Hart said I was out of line for questioning his leadership in the meeting. This occurred at 2.35 p.m. I let him know that everyone has the opportunity for improvement. At the conclusion of the meeting, a whole 25 minutes later at 3 p.m., when everyone was saying their goodbyes and shaking hands, Melvin Williams, still very unhinged at this point, said that I disrespected him with my comments about his leadership. Following the meeting, Ken Hart said that he has never seen Mr. Williams act like that before. But let's be clear about what that is. Let's make a clear description of what that act is. Melvin Williams was threatening, aggressive, combative, and downright unprofessional in that meeting, and he behaved this way with the eyes of his leadership watching. And I believe the reason he felt totally comfortable doing so is because he's been able to operate at this level unchecked. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. As I stand here, board, I recognize a lot of you. Jessica Vaughn uh, fought to help remove the Confederate monument as president of the Democratic Progressive Caucus. Uh, I don't really know the rest of y'all. Oh, Shay, yeah, I know you too, but uh, and Karen too. But I stand with this family because what the parents so graciously didn't bring up is this discrimination cover-up at Sumner High School. Last year, at the end of the year banquet, the white coach gave out novelty awards. This black child got the microaggression award of misattitude. Anybody who understands microaggressions understands how that was a problem. Moving forward to the new season, this coach who clearly had a problem, let her biases affect the two new coaches who are white and determining that this child who was so good as a freshman is not good now. I want to paint a bigger picture. This isn't a picture of just a child trying out, not getting it, and parents are mad. No, this is a black child who has been bullied by white coaches, and there's no accountability from the athletic director to stand up and do what's right. Now, while the parents call for her to be placed on the team because she has collegiate goals of being a cheerleader and furthering her education, this is disrupting that. But I have three demands. One, Melvin Williams should be relieved of his position as athletic director at Sumner High. Two, this child should be instated onto the varsity squad. And three, the coaches who carried on the racist acts of perpetuating the biases of the previous coaches should be removed as well. How can we put her on a varsity team when the racist coaches are still there? This discrimination cover-up is you. horrible. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, please. Oh, whatever, come on. Never mind, she don't want to say nothing. But I do want to say the discrimination link to the Hillsborough County website is broken. So how can people try to uh, Thank make... Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Next speaker. And she may speak then, ma'am. Uh, that, that doesn't occur that way. That's not our policy. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm here anonymously because I was harassed last time I spoke at the board. My business was harassed. Um, so I, um, I'm here because um, I feel as though if I don't say anything, um, nothing will get done. So um, at least if I say something, you're aware of the problem. Um, what I witnessed in an after-school program when I picked up my son, uh, the YMCA is contracted um, to a couple of the elementary schools here. Uh, but what I witnessed was so disturbing to me that um, I, uh, I did contact the school, but I need to tell you here as well what happened. 
Uh, a man who appeared to me to be uh, trans or gay was hugging children from behind and squeezing them very tightly. Um, I have no problem with people's sexual orientation until it involves children. But what I was witnessing was this man um, s hugging children seemed very, very strange, and even uh, children were straddling him as well as they hugged him. Um, as a former uh, social worker with, with, well, as a volunteer with CASA and GAL, I worked very closely with social work in other states, and I know the type of training that you need to do in order to be, to have the privilege to work with children. What I want to know is, is the YMCA doing their due diligence to background check people for these contracts? Are you looking into this? Who contracted the YMCA? That's what I want to know. I did contact the vice principal, and they said they've been very unhappy with the program, um, and they have contacted the Y several times about this program. If they've been very unhappy with them, why do they continue to contract them? That's what I want to know. What's going on there at this local level? What are we doing? Um, and this, to me, seemed like a grooming situation. I've looked into this. I've talked to other parents about this. This is grooming at its finest. And guess what? Thank He's you. Still Next there. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Carden, and I'm the executive director of the Hillsboro affiliate of CCDF USA. I'm also a real parent and a real grandparent. What I want to address today is the obscene books in the school libraries, over 200 of which are of concern. That is, they meet the statutory definitions of obscene or the definition of deviant sexual intercourse or are harmful to minors as that is defined in Florida Statutes 847. These are criminal statutes. People from all parts of our county are currently reviewing the books to show exactly why each is objectionable and illegal pursuant to Florida law. We're also reviewing the books in light of the parental rights statute, which is the civil statute. Some of the books currently in our school libraries patently violate this law because they grossly normalize acts defined by Florida statute as obscene. They deprive children of innocence and they deprive parents of the right to direct their children's moral education. It's a direct violation of any parent's rights for the school system to allow books in the libraries that groom children for sex, which many of these books do. As we've heard earlier, earlier today, many of them are easy to see how they violate this law. We do not intend to go through a bureaucratic process in each school where these books reside to try to remove them. We intend to address this as the legal matter that it is. We have attempted to meet with each of the school board members and the superintendent with marginal success. Thank you very much to those who have been willing to meet with us. We'll make one more attempt this week. We intend to hold this body accountable for providing obscene, harmful materials to children. In closing, I sincerely hope that no one here will misrepresent what I'm saying. CCDF is shining the light on this issue to protect children from statutorily defined harmful material. It is transparently disingenuous to describe that as Thank book you. Banning. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Debbie Hunt, also with CCDF. You've heard about inappropriate, pornographic books that are just not the right books to be in the school libraries for over a year now, and nothing is being done. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's so important to know is that when children see these books, it then creates a norm for them. It then becomes something that is normal to them because especially when you when you speak about seven and under children seven and under they don't have a pre preconceived idea of what is normal and so when these books are put in in front of them and people are showing and they're able to get to them even if you say no they can't get to them they can and they do and then that becomes the norm for them and because they have never known anything different they cannot get that or have that removed from their minds. It is totally inappropriate going through the process that um, 
would take years to go through every single school for every single book because some of these books are in 20 or more schools, whether it be the elementary schools, the middle schools, or the high schools. So the request is that they be removed and that as we come forward or as we provide that list that you all do something about it. Um, also, you have an agenda item on the panorama education, which is social emotional learning. That particular item, yes, you already have a contract with them. However, um, it has been shown many times that that is not good teaching for the children, and it takes away from their core curriculum, which is the reading, writing, arithmetic, and history, and would like to see the good teachers that are out there be able to continue teaching that instead of sidetracked. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our public comment, and thank you, everyone, who came today. Um, I need a motion, a second, to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Washington, and I have a second by Member Gray. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. The following items will now be heard, C-102, C-103, C-104R, C-301, C-302, C-303, C-501, C-901, C-903, C-904, C-1001, C-1002, and C-1003. First agenda item, sole source purchase of digital curriculum for applied educational systems. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item, 102. Yes, ma'am. The chair, 102 is a purchase of digital curriculum for applied educational systems. This is for us to be able to make certain that we have continued curriculum to address applied businesses, which is for our computer application, for business one and two, entrepreneurship, fashion marketing, uh, sports marketing, and marketing in, in scale. And also allows us to be able to gain access to content and curriculum as well for Health Century 21, which really ha has been approved by the State Board of Nursing. This is a $64,000 expenditure leveraging Perkins, Perkins funds and this right currently right now will impact around 12,000 projected students this year within our school district. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C-102. I have a motion by member Snively, and I have a second by member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Actually, I got my questions answered. Thank you. Thank you, member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. Member Gray is off the dais, and it passes unanimously with Member Gray, who's um, not at the dais right now. 103, sole source um, purchase of seven mindsets, um, sell liquidity, online portal license consulting, coaching, and customized district and site-based professional development from Seven Mindsets Academy, LLC. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. the Chair, this is another way for us to really uh, to address uh, the well-being of, of our students, to really focus on giving them and our students through our teachers' lessons and also professional development and resources to address Tier 1 or, of our work and our uh, in the middle capacity of our students. It focuses on seven areas, which is linked to making certain that students understand that everything is possible, also that passion comes first, understanding that we are connected, alongside of being making certain there's 100% accountability, also looking at how they can uh, being able to transition to be giving and servant leaders, and at the same token, making certain they understand their time is now to maximize all their resources. This is going to impact 40 schools in our school district, six of them. Uh, this is split funding because we have a stop grant. This is all about being able to look at preventing school violence. Six schools will be connected to the stop grant, which were drafted and written in the grant a couple years ago. And at the same token, we have 34 schools that have been identified as foundational schools. Every school in this district has access to these resources and materials, but openly this is our foundation schools will have access to, to fully trained staff. They have these the staff members that are, are willing to be able to embed this in their, in their curriculum. 
They have uh, customized uh, plans to be able to address the unique needs of their schools. And at the same token, they have unlimited access to the, the Seven Mindsets portal. And at the same token, being able to support this process. We have Julia Sarmento here, that are supervisors of SEL at the same token with Student Success to be able to expand on this initiative. Yeah, push the button. Sorry, I didn't realize I had to push a button. Um, so we're just excited about this initiative. Um, all of our schools will have access to the curriculum and be able to um, to uh, to teach these skills to, to students. And it is a skill. So that is something that I always stress when we're talking about social emotional learning, that it is a skill that has to be pro uh, practiced. It's a skill to resolve conflict and know how to build healthy relationships with with other students and how to manage their anger or manage frustrations or um, different of a, uh, differences in, in opinion. So especially um, at those transition years. So we're just really excited to be able to continue to um, support our schools with um, this curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-103. I have a motion by Member Gray and I have a second by Member Member Vaughn, uh, Member Snively, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I, I struggle with some of the information that we receive around social emotional learning because I actually, um, I'm a proponent of emotional intelligence and I believe that it really does make a difference in academic performance for students. And I know that there's some controversy up, out there about um, collecting information through surveys that's on the, that's the next agenda item we'll talk about that at that point but um, but at this point uh, I, I truly believe in the seven mindsets and I know that there's some argument about um, getting back to the basics of um, learning uh, reading and math and and history and those are all obviously what the students are in school for However, if you're in the classrooms and you see that there's a hurdle to get over with emotional intelligence first before you can almost be effective in teaching and effective in, and for a student to be in, in fact, affected um, in a learning environment positively. So, um, so I, I do support this I, and frameworks who we've partnered with also in the past on social emotional learning. Um, I'm, I'm sad that there are people who don't necessarily prioritize this um, in our schools just because I know that that is a skill that, that these students are going to need to be prepared for life. That as an employer, as an employer, I would rather them almost have a higher emotional quotient than intelligence quotient. Because that is more, to me, that is really preparing students for life. You've got to know how to have relationships, how to have healthy relationships. You've got to know how to self-manage. You've got to be aware of yourself in order to be a good team player, in order to be a good employee or employer. In, in order to be effective in society. So um, so I do support this. I'm not crazy about number 104, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, but I do support seven mindsets, and I think social-emotional learning, in addition to our core curriculum together, can be the most impactful, um, can be the most impactful component that we teach our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. Member Vaughn? Thank you, Member Snively. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that recently I went to Heritage Islands, which is one of my schools that is um, transforming from, you know, being um, a traditionally low performing school to a high performing school. And they really base it on the seven mind steps. They've gone as far as to have an art club that picks one mindset each year and they create a whole mural and the school is alive with colors. And, you know, every time you talk to administration, they talk about how the seven mindsets Oh, we have a teacher from Heritage back there. <laughs> um, it's just such a such a great component to that school. Um, so I'm I'm really appreciative that you know Member Snively sees the value in it. Um, anywhere I've gone where they've implemented this, they've spoken to how transformative it's been to to really be integrated into our curriculum. So I just wanted to speak in favor of it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez. 
You know, I was speaking with someone regarding social emotional learning, and um, in that in that um, transaction, we were um, they gave me this awesome um, um, picture of the social emotional learning being the plate and the education being everything else on that plate. And if the students do not have the plate, we could give them everything else and they don't have it, you know, they don't have anything to put it on. So um, with that depiction, it was perfect, you know, um, because they'll go through life without that foundation um, to put everything else on. So um, this, I, I, I totally agree with um, this, this mindset uh, sequility. Um, and then definitely we, we do need to talk about the next one. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Gray? You know, I uh, look at this too historically. Um, you know, we always say the children are the same or the children stay the same. I remember Mitch Muley at Ben Hill years ago. You know, children are children. Well, I, I think indeed we have different type of, ch of child now. I think we have a child that comes to school with a tremendous amount of baggage, uh, social emotional uh, currents run throughout the child's mind. Uh, we all know as uh, educators and as an employer that uh, before a person can work or a student learns, they have to have the social emotional strength and uh, well-being. Um, uh, Member Perez, you know that all too well, and Member Snively. Um, I will say this, we do have a new type of student, and I will say that whether you call Panorama uh, Seven Mindsets, Ms. Um, Aramento, you have embraced uh, the needs, the social, mental, and your staff needs of our children. And Superintendent Davis, we can never forget that these programs, maybe they're not the perfect one. How can you have a perfect program uh, to get all of the different um, mindsets? But what if we didn't have these programs for these children? What if we let the social, emotional, a development of a child lapse when what would we have after COVID and all the other emergencies and I might say I'm looking at teachers in the uh, in the audience our teachers need the same they need to have the social emotional security and stability of a of, a, of their students so at any rate I agree uh, member Snively um, member Vaughn Member Perez, uh, programs such as Panorama, which I know is very, very near and dear, and uh, Seven Mindsets, and we might even have more on the agenda, but I have found them to be very effective. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Please vote when your lights, oh, yes, please vote when your lights appear. Okay, and it passes unanimously. 104, service order with Panorama Education Incorporated for Panorama Social Emotional Learning, Platform License Project Management and Customized Professional Development. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, this is an opportunity, this is a transition into our third year for the survey to really just get a pulse of you know, how our students are, you know, feeling about themselves related to a, a leader and being able to be actively engaged and be organized every day within our school district. And at the same token, it's an opportunity for them to be able to look at the overall supports they receive in the educational environment and at the same token, how they feel that teaching and learning takes place within the school. You know, teachers get a chance to review this data to make informed decisions. This is not in any way, shape, or form to, to identify or label any individual students, but at aggregate to see how they can, how the students' mindsets are related to being actively engaged in learning and how, what they need in an effort to be successful. So this is all about being able to have a responsive culture and the same token being able to make certain that we have student voice along the way. Um, and this is implemented in grades four through 12. And last year, I think we had around 86,000 students actively engaged in the survey. We do give an opportunity. I know the last year there was conversation about making certain that students have a opt out, parents have an opt out for their learners. 
That will go out uh, but prior to any survey. It'll be a hard copy documentation that we send, and that information will be able to come back so we can identify whether or not that learner wants to be involved in that process. This is actively engaged in 48 states in the United States and 900 school districts as well. Um, and so, again, once again, there is a pre-assessment and also a post-assessment so we can continue to learn and grow uh, at the school level with the, with the voices of our students. Anything, Ms. Jillian? Um, and I just wanted to, um, I'm glad that we actually talked about seven mindsets prior to Panorama because this data is what guides a lot of the decision making with how we choose a lot of our programming. And so with the survey, it is that tier one climate and culture, like what is happening? It's a, it's a pulse check of what is, is happening on the campus. And it is a snapshot. It is not all encompassing of how every student feels, but it, um, with, when you engage the learners and you engage the survey implementation at the school, you get a really good sense of what is happening. And a lot of the data that we're seeing, it's very reflective in what's happening on campus. Um, I'm so glad that Heritage was highlighted because they're doing such amazing things on that campus with the support of both of these programs and both of these um, instruments. And the survey is um, with ad um, administrative feedback with feedback from our principals that said, hey, this is, we want to do it earlier. So the first year we implemented it, we, they didn't get results back until almost December. Um, and we, now we moved it up to October where they have it before they leave for fall break. So any of those um, pieces that come back that they can make that, you know, they can make action on that data. It's, it's in real time. And we've never been able to have something like that before since we brought on Panorama. The second part is the same survey is given at, in the spring. So it's kind of like with that continuous model of learning that our governor is also doing those touch points, that progress monitoring. That's one of the things that Panorama does as well is that now in the spring we can look at it and we give it in February again with principal feedback to have it before spring break so when our students come back from spring break for the first time last year principals had that data they we received we um, delivered the survey in February and right before they came back from spring break all of our administrators had that data back and they were able to make changes and listen to that student voice and this is this is what our students are saying and uh, it'll mimic a, what a lot of the adults on campus feel but i know sometimes um, we listen to a lot of the adults but we really need to start listening to the heartbeat of the school which is our students and making those changes so with panorama we are able to look at things like um, sense of belonging how are the relationships between the students and those teachers students that have ieps and 504s let's look at what you know what our students are saying about their learning and let's see if we can work together to use this to guide that our student success coaches are using this data to work one-on-one -on -one with some of our most vulnerable um, students so i um i if there's any other questions i can answer i'm very passionate just about what we can do for our students academics of course are critical but it is that social emotional and academic component together you need both and um i love that illusion the um the the imagery of the plate it's been something that we don't often share but when you when we don't have that basic need you know was that maslow's before bloom right when we don't serve that that basic need um we we do a real disservice to our students thank you thank you very much um i need a motion a second to approve approve item c104r I have a motion by Member Vaughn, and I have a second by Member Washington. Member Snively, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I first thank you for putting the uh, survey out, attaching it to the agenda item. I think that was important for um, the board to be able to see the survey and what questions are asked on the survey. And that was, I guess, a point of contention for a lot of parents. So two things I want to make um, clear um, and maybe ask the superintendent. Uh, the survey questions or the survey itself, um, there are a lot of parents who don't want to participate or don't want their child to participate in the survey. And you mentioned an opt-out form, a physical opt-out form that is sent home with each child, right? Yes, um, and do you also have an electronic form that will be going out as well electronically in case that form never makes it out of the student's backpack because we all know that probably happens more often than not. 
Yes, ma'am. Through the chair, right now we actually started discussing whether or not we can make that happen and be able to send it availability. So I'll work with staff uh, tomorrow morning mm -hmm. to see if we can link that up and put that in Canvas so that can be able or it connects so they can have an option to be able to click and insert and electronically sign. That would be really helpful because I think you would get, well, two things. You would get more parents probably that um, would be more aware of what's happening at the school site and especially if they're not willing to um, have their child take the survey, then at least they would have that uh, authority to to stop that. Um, because there, you know, there there are some what I could could what we some people might consider, and and there's a section on racism that some people may feel very uncomfortable um, with their ch child taking that survey, and if they don't want that child to answer those questions, then that should be their prerogative to, to do that. So, but I do think it needs to be made. An, an easier process because it seems a little bureaucratic to send home a piece of paper in this in this age of technology when it can just be a a link an email that goes out we get emails all the time as parents and it could be an easy link or an attachment in an email and what would even be better as speaking as a parent is if you attach the survey questions so the parents could see what questions are being asked of their child because even if I as a parent decide not to allow my child to take the survey maybe i would like to have a conversation with my child about the survey and about and maybe have a conversation as a parent child relationship on some of the aspects of the survey so i understand what the data is used for and i understand how helpful it is in guiding some of the material but i also really want to make sure that parent parents rights are respected when it comes to giving that data out in the school setting from their for their from their children to our school district. So I would really, as a um, again as a parent, uh, I would really like to see more transparency around this particular survey. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Member Snively, Member Perez. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So um, the first question is the money allocated, the funds allocated to this, can they be used elsewhere or? they are used specifically for this yes Mr. chair this is mental health dollars so mm -hmm. it can be spent anything related to mental health connection and this is one of the way we do it through, through capture and student voice okay and um my, con my i have a concern why do you think that only eighty six thousand students out of you know we have two hundred thousand plus students in this district why do you think that only eighty six thousand participated I think for some of the concerns that maybe Ms. Ms. Nively might have mentioned was um, not, not knowing what the survey is and then also some of the students that on the days that, and I would also say that it's the, the day that the survey is given. Um, I know sometimes it's right before spring break and students may not be there or things happen or families are already planning those trips. So we could look at some of those dates, but I think a lot of it is communication of just making sure that we're streamlining that communication. Um, I was previously in a different division, so now we're moving over to kind of on the ground with um, academics, with teachers, and I'll be in front of a different audience that I wasn't. Um, previously, I was more with our student um, services department counselors and that piece, so I think just streamlining that communication a little bit better. Um, teachers will have access to all of this data to be able to use it, and we're working with our curriculum and instruction side of the house to see how we can guide some of those pieces. So I think once we understand what it is and what it isn't, um, there's, there is that, um, that, uh, that fine line of this is all prevention. This is all preventative to make sure that we're supporting the students' needs. So um, I am all on board with trying to make sure and work with anybody that we need to to make sure that our administrators, our parents, our students understand exactly what we're using this for. So and we can increase participation. Yes, ma'am, through the chair, this is only used for grade levels four through 12. So mm -hmm. some of our biggest pockets of learners are in the early stages. And how does 103 and 104 support each other? So basically with um, the feedback that we're receiving from some of this data and the student voice, it uses us, um, we're using this to guide some of the supplemental materials that we're using in the classroom and some of the changes that we're making on campus around climate and culture for that tier one support. Do you find that um, with the recent uptick in mental health, 
um, and everything that's been going on recently. Have, have you found that um, the participation in this and um, in the Panorama S um, SEL has increased or has it decreased? I would have to look at that, but I look at if we look at individual schools with their participation rate, I think we can drill down. We can drill down to see which schools are having those those um, those high increases in the the services that are being provided with mental health services, and then the um, the participation rate at that school. So if we have a, a 92 participation rate at some of these schools and we're able to kind of like align it and look at it, we can make some of those determinations. But I think we would have to look at it across the board and at each individual school site. And will this eventually help us in the, with mental health services provide those supports into the schools? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, that's all I needed, thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Hahn? Thank you, uh, Member Combs. Um, my, my concern is more around the protection of personal data. Um, I mean, you know, I've gone through this with my own children where there's been a data breach and it's been a nightmare recently. So, um, you know, I, I am concerned about what type of personal information is captured when a student goes on to take the survey. They enter their student number, so it's, as far as anything personal, the the climate and culture pieces, like the tier one, like teacher-student relationships and how they feel about their campus and maybe um, uh, what is happening, that is not identifiable. The only things that are um, drilled down to the student level are the SEO competencies. So for example, um, self-efficacy or sense of, uh, the sense of belonging is not, if that's uh, the tier one, but self-efficacy. So a student is self-reporting how they feel about growth mindset, how they feel about pushing through tough situations. So we're able to identify down to the student for those to be able to kind of provide supports and interventions, but there is nothing, there, there are no like personal Right, like no, I, I think what I'm, I'm not really talking about the answers being attached to the student as much as the access that Panorama has to student data names, ages, addresses, social security numbers, anything around personal information. It's so, yeah. that, I, I mean, what you shared was important, but I was guess I was more on the, you know, how Panorama is storing that information, who has access to it, um, you know, where, where, is Pan, where are their offices located? Are they within the United States? sharing agreement with Panorama at this point, um, and that does cover the overall utilization of the data that's provided. Um, they do also outline what their measures are for securing the data, um, and then um, what the types of activities they need to follow uh, in terms of uh, any type of data breach. Um, in terms of personally identifiable information, uh, you know, that is something they only collect a small portion of that. And again, it depends What's on how. Small portion, exactly. Uh, I, would, I would have to find the specific fields for you. I don't know that uh, right off the top of my head. Is there a third party access to the data through Panorama? Um, I would have to double check that. I do not believe that there is um, from a personally identifiable perspective. Through the chair, there is not, and they are located in Boston. Sorry, go ahead. So there's no third party access. They can't sell the data. They can't right. utilize the data in any of their studies or research. No, ma'am. No, ma okay. Thank you. Are, are you a uh, member? Thank you. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, Member Vaughn? Thank you. Um, I feel like we went through this last year, right? Did we, didn't we have the same conversation and questions or last time we approved this? Um, I was curious, um, I thought Member Snively, didn't you ask for it to be uploaded online last time too, the, the opt-out form? But what I was curious about was whether it was electronic or paper, how many parents opted out of the survey last year or the last time we gave it? That is housed at each school site, so I don't know. I don't have that number exactly, so. Okay. 
but you can get that back to us. Maybe next time we discuss it, we'll have an idea of how many parents are opting out and what that looks like. And then I know that with this, we're not specifically talking about this, but as we talk about the conversation of data and online and our students moving towards that, I have similar questions as we have that conversation about the fast testing, right, which is going to be completely done online now. Our progress monitoring, that's going to be done three times a year instead of once, once that replaces the FSA, all of that is going to be moved online. So the concerns and questions that we're having now as we talk about data and privacy and student information, we're going to have to holistically have as we talk about our the way that the state is now mandating that our, our progress monitoring be done online, right? Because we're going to have the same questions about access to data and student privacy. Is that correct? We potentially could have the same questions. I know the Department of Education has uh, articulation agreements with their vendors as well, and they work to be able to make certain that that information is not accessed in the same token. It does not have third-party availability to be able to sell information. So that sounds like the crux of it, whether or not it has third-party availab uh, availability. Okay, I appreciate it. I just had those two questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Member Vaughn. And I just wanted to echo some of the sentiments that I've heard. I think it's really important that, you know, parents do have that choice. They can opt out their children. Those are coming in hard copies. We want to make sure we have that electronically. I think we're talking about this so much, and I think it's great that we're talking about it. And Member Snively, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, EQ is just as important as IQ. I mean, it's really, really important for people to understand, and especially now when we're seeing um, the suicides rates being so high across the district, um, across the country. And I think it's really important that I, I like that we're checking throughout the year how things are going, how kids are feeling, to making sure that that classroom culture is not just inside the classroom, but as well as the school. So I think it's really important. As we do progress monitoring, and that's such a focus where we're going to start testing kids in kindergarten, well, it's really important to see how they're doing and how they're feeling. There's so many challenges that our students are facing right now. So I think the idea that we do have an opt-out, I don't think that this is something that we have shown, has shown to prove in schools. We're seeing improvements in schools. We're seeing a relationship building. And we're also seeing internally what, how we can improve each and every child's experience at our schools and how they're feeling about that. So I think this is a great program. I know we worry about, you know, you know, we, of course we want our students' information to be completely, completely, you know, held privately and we will continue to do that. That's a priority. There's no secret way we're, we're trying to like manipulate kids. We're trying to find out how are you doing? Please look at these questions. Parents, take time and look at these questions and spend time with your children finding out how they're feeling because sometimes what you see at home is not what you see at school and it's not what you see at a child's when they're at a friend's house. So it's really important to be able to capture how kids are feeling and how they're thriving and making sure that we're doing what we need to do for them to be able to focus academically and, and basically strive as, a, as an adult. So um, thank you and I will move on to Member Perez. I just had one more question, believe it or not. Um, are students able to not answer some questions and answer some questions or do you have to answer all the questions? They can skip questions. So if they are not comfortable answering one of the questions, um, we encourage them, especially with the SEL competency um, portion, to finish all, to complete every single one so we can, we can gauge how they feel about their learning and how we can guide some of those pieces. But yes, once they hit submit, it'll, we'll only, and we only match um, the questions that they answer as well. Thank you, Member Press. Member Washington? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think the program is a great program. But my concern is when I was looking at the numbers, we only have about 24% of the kids taking this survey. So whatever we need to do, we, we need to have more kids involved taking, taking the survey because 24% in that area is not very good when we are trying to use this program to be efficient for students. That's the concern I have. So you have something in mind? I think it was higher than that. Is that yeah. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, it was it was higher than that, but I don't know what number you're looking at, but we'll verify it. Um, okay. But I think things like this are great. There's just communicating it, and I am definitely um, willing, and I know everybody here is willing to just um, share how important this information is. So uh, uh, we will definitely get in front of the right people and our principals to make sure that our students and parents understand um, how they can, how can, how we're using this to support them. That sounds real good. We can make it happen. Yes, we can. Um, thank you, Member Washington. Member Hahn? 
Thank you, Member Combs. Um, so I, I know that this service has come to us in the past a few times, but we should never assume that the terms of the contract are the same when it comes back to the board the following year. Thus, my questions. Um, so with the um, seven mindsets, do they do a survey at all around SEL to kind of get a baseline before they through the chair, no, ma'am, they do not. It's just more of a curriculum in, in whether they do spend 10 minutes in isolation or embed it within their instruction. So it's just more of being able to have lessons to be able to embed for our learners. They don't do any type of survey no, with this parents, students. Okay. And what is the timeline for this survey to go out? Remind me. It'll be October. It'll be in the fall. It'll be three weeks in October. And then we will turn key and do the post in three weeks in February. And, you know, I, I share the concerns of some of my colleagues around the, um, the, the low percentage of students participating. And, um, you know, I do think, as Member Snively suggested, an electronic version um, go out to, to parents to maybe make them aware if they want their child to participate um, or not. But, you know, I just think that that would, might help with one way or the other getting getting folks on board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Washington. Thank you. I went back and calculated 40%. Don't forget, now I taught driver's ed, so I'm not a math person. <laughs> so when it, when, whenever a person make a mistake, I want to always come back and correct it so you'll know, okay? 40%, you're right. I'm They're a on it. major, too, so I, I didn't want to... <laughs> Verify any math. I give that right. to somebody else. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we'll calculate it and get it uh, approved because I know it's grades four through twelve. Uh, Member Gray. Yeah, I'd like to call the question. Okay, calling the question requires a second. Second. And the chair cannot second. Oh, so. I can't second. Okay, Ms. Bond, a second. There's no debate. So, board members, uh, clear the, clear, please clear the screen. If you're in favor of voting on this immediately without further discussion, vote yes. If you want to continue the discussion, vote no. And it passes 5 to 2, um, 5 saying that they will go ahead and vote. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and call the question and please vote. We're going to be voting on, on 104. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes with six to one with um, Member Snively voting no. We will move on to the next, which is 301. The um, sole, per sole source purchase of readiness and writing kit with my first book set educational products with accompanying on-site professional development day from learning without tears. And this comes from the Federal Grants and Administration. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, Mr. the Chair. This is an opportunity to strengthen our PEATS program and also, uh, which is 109 of our pre-K classrooms at the same token, 116 of our, of our PEATS voluntary pre-K blended classrooms as well. And this is not only to identify curriculum, but ongoing professional development that leans to have scaffold instructional supports, being able to look at timed uh, test manipulatives, hands-on learning, additional platforms, and also multi-sensory uh, activities to engage our young minds in our classrooms. This is for our ESE pre-K, which is $171,000. will be identified by leveraging our categoricals, our American Rescue IDEA pre-K funding. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion a second to approve item C301. I have a motion by Member Vaughn, and I have a second by Member Gray. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do, thank you. Um, so I had a lot of questions, and I appreciate uh, Ms. Brown <laughs> uh, answering a lot of the questions for me, um, as well as providing a list of the description of things that are gonna be in this kit. Um, one of the things that I talked about, Ms. Brown, with both this and the next one coming up, 302, are kits like this that we're going to be giving in our classrooms I think are great, um, especially when we're talking about engaging modalities and talking about manipulatives and hands-on things, moving away from just online learning. Um, my concern was around, one, making sure and understanding the cost analysis of this. Um, and from my understanding, I just want to clarify that we're not purchasing these kits every year, that there might be pieces from it that next year we're going to go 
go back and reevaluate. There might be some additional pieces, but this is more of a one-time purchase for these kits that will be utilized in the classroom. So I appreciate the explanation on that. Um, the other concern that I wanted to make sure that I addressed is with all of the professional development around these kits, because as I expressed to Ms. Brown, it's great if we have these tools and we have these extra kits and these manipulatives that encourage modalities, but if our teachers and our staff members and our pairs don't feel supported in using these and understanding how to in integrate them into the classroom, they're not really necessarily, we're not getting as much as we could out of those. So I do see here that we have virtual sessions being offered for professional development, and I know we have more professional development on the next item. And you know, I'm just wondering if when we have items like this and we're negotiating professional development, if we can get feedback from our teachers and our staff, especially in the, if we have selected item, I mean areas that we're going to put them in, whether they would rather have an in-person training or whether they get the information they need through virtual trainings, because I'm really concerned that we have good professional development around these agenda items that come up. Yes, ma'am, we will absolutely get feedback from our teachers going forward before we make any purchase to ensure that the professional development is appropriate for teachers. Thank you, I appreciate it. That's the question I had. Thanks so much. Thank you, Member Vaughn. And just a quick, quick comment. I just want to say this, this is just a really great curriculum. I've seen it for many years. It's been around for a long time. It really is so critical. And we know more and more how important, important it is for us to continue to focus on our earliest learners. So I just, I think this is a wonderful curriculum and a wonderful program. So thank you for bringing this item to us. Um, thank you. Um, please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. Okay, we will move on to 302, sole source purchase of Motor Lab kit pre-K, gold kit from Ready Bodies for Learning Minds, LLC. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, this is another opportunity to be able to strengthen our pre-K classrooms along with this gold kit, which is all about being able to improve instruction and provide individual instruction to be able to focus on literacy, be able to focus on learning, mathematics, and also communication. So there are 39 uh, schools that will be impacted by using the Gold Kit, and we, we, will, be, we will be leveraging a, a number of ongoing uh, progress monitoring tools embedded as a link to the new best standards for progress monitoring. And this, once again, is being able to use IDA categorical funding in our pre-K um, arena. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C302. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Perez. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I don't. My, uh, my last comments stand for this agenda item as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. We will now move on to employee input. It's now close to 6 p.m. We will now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at four. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representative, emails, phone calls, and one-on-one -on -one conversations and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we are creating another cute, uh, avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for the employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or district. Each speaker will have three minutes. I will now call the first three speakers. Good evening, everyone. Rob Creed, president of CTA. Um, I, I truly don't even know what to say tonight. I, I think I'm not just standing up here and just shrug. Um, I'm, I've been here all night. I, I hear the concerns of the community. I hear what's going on in our district, and uh, I, I wish I had better answers, but we're going to need to be very creative in how we're going to navigate these years as we try to recruit and retain teachers. Um, we, uh, we did get to the bargaining table yesterday and we are engaging our members across the district now about what, what our next steps will be and what we want to do. Um, 
I just want to say that, you know, there were a lot of things that we, uh, we talked about at the table and we appreciate you guys coming back to it. But however, is when we talked at the table yesterday, you know, all of our employees are making less dollars today than they were last year. Not only in, the, in their salary, but even when they're covering classes. And by the way, they're going to be doing that more and more this year than ever before. They're making less dollars. I mean, we've had an MOU for two years that has not been renewed. And when I asked at the table yesterday, like, what are we doing when we're uh, for coverage of classes and the splitting of classes? You know what I got? That same shrug. Um, so I think that's something that you guys can take a look at and see what are we doing for our teachers that are, are being asked to cover classes all day. Um, they're exhausted, they feel disrespected, and they still want to do what's best for our kids in our community. So we need to recognize that and find a way. Creativity is going to be necessary more than ever before. Uh, section 3.3.3 of our contract states, schools shall not schedule conference nights or open house on the second Thursday of any month, except in case of an emergency. Does anyone know why that is? Yes, it is. To have rep council, Alex. Yes, for rep council, but yet next week we have a school board meeting on a Thursday. Why, why is that? Do we know? Is there an emergency that I don't know of? Anyway, there is an emergency in our district. We're asking you to solve it creatively. We want to work with you. Work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Carissa Denica from uh, Gaither High School. I hate reading off of my phone, but uh, I was doing this while uh, on my lunch making copies because that's what I do. First, I'd like to point out that I'm here on my birthday um, instead of being with, with my family, which makes my next statement even more important to me. Every time an employee come up, comes up here to comment, I want to make sure that you know that we aren't just complaining. We're, we come up here to fight for our careers. The ones that aren't here are quietly finding new careers and will never tell you the reason they're leaving. I hope you hear us and make moves to improve. My classes are large, so large in fact that I don't have enough seats and frankly, um, I don't have the largest classes in my school. With classes this large, teachers are having to decide on what can be done in regards to time rather than what is best for students. Another issue with these classes is that large classes are pushing out our higher level classes. Our Algebra 2 classes are so large that one of my AP classes was dissolved and it had a fair amount of students in there. Like many schools, this meant that there are students that no longer could take my class because their schedule couldn't fit other classes. This means that there are students in my school that will not get the opportunity to pass the AP statistics exam. As a teacher who has students pass at a higher rate than the state and global pass rates, this means that these students are missing out and this district is missing out on that. I want to point out that I offered to do a T payroll and was told the district wouldn't allow it. Why do you pay principals over $100,000 a year and then question every decision that they make? If we trust them to run the school, why are they micromanaged in terms of needs for the school? Algebra 2 books haven't come in yet, so teachers have had to make copies of the pages so that we could continue in the curriculum. Now, I understand that things happen to make, that, to make it so that they aren't here. If it's the fault of the company, the company should be providing extra paper to cover the deficiencies. If it's the fault of the district, more paper should have been covered by the, the district or more co or copies should have been made. Since they didn't come, we are having to make copies on time, um, on time that we already don't have and on paper that is allotted for other things. Then on top of this, we are doing unit changes early. I get that, except observations are also being done early. The same day that schedules were changed for leveling and classes were dissolving, administration started their observations. So now there are teachers being observed on how well they know their students when less than a week ago they got those students. I have never in my career not known the names of my students, and this year I can tell you of maybe half of them because it's so uh, disheartening, so moving in this. I'm telling you that we are four weeks into this year, and I'm tired, and I'm one bad day from finding a new job. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, everybody. Um, I am here again to speak up for the profession and teachers and students that I love so much. 
Um, if you don't remember me from last meeting, I am Nicole Teagarden, part of the second generation of Crawfords to dedicate our lives and careers to this district. Generation number three starts VPK next year. I'm here to share ideas on how you can start fixing this teacher shortage, lessen some of the budgetary issues in this district, and start to rebuild the trust that you've broken. I'd like to start with how you can earn back the trust of employees on this in this district. Meaningful programs that support employees other than just the obvious paying us appropriately. Since I mentioned generation number three, a way you could support young families like mine and my sisters in this district is to bring back or expand the typical peer program for employee students or employees' children who are three years old. It was a program that allowed students employ or employees' children to come to school with them daily for a low cost. This will help offset the insane cost of childcare for educators while also preparing our children for kindergarten. You could consider a four-day work week. This could save costs on electricity like it does in summer. It could also show that Hillsborough is willing to think outside of the box in regards to attracting new teachers to this district. 41 counties in Texas already operate on a four-day work week. Another way you could save is just by putting district admin on the teacher salary scale because teachers and ESPs are the most important employees in this district. That is evidenced by the fact that district administrators and resource personnel are being put back into classrooms this year to address the teacher shortage crisis that we are currently experiencing. I can imagine that you did this because you also realize that the people who work in classrooms hold the most important jobs in this district. When the only way to make a decent living in this county is to get out of the classroom and up into an administrative position, we actively make this problem worse. So by putting everybody back on the pay scale that we are on, you incentivize staying in the classroom and working hard as a teacher. But I'm sure that idea won't be popular. There are some other obvious ways that you could save money too sell off property that we're not currently using like ROSAC and move operations to ISC, rezone school maps to alleviate pressure on overcrowded schools and also use the classrooms that sit empty, open district contracts to more vendors. Did you know that Staples once charged me $4 for a single spiral notebook that cost 10 cents on a back to school sale? After the last board meeting's employee comment, you came out to speak to us, Mr. Davis, and you said you are working on things behind the scenes to make our troubles better. I think I speak for a lot of us when I say we we want to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, nice to see some of you again. Nice to meet some of you. Um, my name is Emily Greist. I currently teach art and art history at Riverview High School. Um, educating has been the only career I have ever wanted to do due to my absolutely amazing high school art teachers that I had uh, when I lived in Pennsylvania. I've gotten my master's degree. I teach seven preps during a six period day. And I do all of that to make sure that my students have the best art education possible. Three of those preps are AP classes. Needless to say, I work my butt off. I care so much about these kids, and I want to make sure that their education matches how much I care. Uh, while I still love getting in front of my art kids every single day, the disrespect at the bargaining table absolutely has to change. Uh, not having our two years of service honored is, quite frankly, unacceptable. Every teacher I know has worked their butt off to make it through the last few years. Um, and then hearing over and over again at the bargaining table, I've been to, I think, every single session we've had, um, telling us that your last two years didn't count is insulting. I know I worked my butt off. I know my friends have worked their butt off. I know my colleagues have worked their butt off. And to hear that that doesn't count is just horrific. Uh, morale and education is at a low. No one at this table, no one in this room can deny that due to both the disrespect at the bargaining table and the anti-public education rhetoric that's coming out of Tallahassee right now. Um, how can you expect to fill over 500 teacher vacancies and attract new teachers to the profession when you're not willing to do the bare minimum and honor our years of service? Um, you cannot continue to balance this budget on the backs of the employees. Our backs are breaking. We cannot carry this burden anymore. Um, our years of service are compensation for our hours worked. 
Um, and Addison Davis, I'm calling on you directly to find a way to bring our years of service to the bargaining table. It is the absolute least you can do to give us the years of service that we have earned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Rebecca Bohr and I teach at Riverview High School. I am a reading teacher, intensive reading. Um, earlier during this meeting, I heard multiple proposals of different programs that you can buy and do things with. Some of them I like, some of them I don't like. But all I could think about was the amount of waste that I have seen in this district over my seven years here. For example, in, uh, in June of 2020, apparently this district spent $3.7 million on a program called Achieve 3000. I had to teach Achieve 3000 for the year, and let me tell you, it sucked. It didn't work for lots of various reasons that I won't go into, but it didn't work. And apparently spent $3.7 million on that. What happened to it? Because it was here for one year and disappeared. Um, I understand that uh, your brother, uh, Mr. Davis, works with Achieve 3000, and I wonder how Christmases have gone when you sit down across the table from him and you're like, hey, how about that $3.7 million we sent on Achieve? How, like, we're, we're, like, it didn't work. Um, it's not the only example of waste. We currently, I'm supposed to be using a program called Language Live as a reading teacher. It's not up and working yet, just so y'all know. It replaced several other programs from last year that were working just fine, but you know we had to go and purchase something new. Um, with that, we've also purchased a new curriculum um, that includes, this is my student textbook for the year. Um, not just mine, I'm actually sharing this with English because we don't have our own. So I have Debbie did this out. Um, I'm doing unit one. So all of my students had to tear this out and put it into a three ring binder so they can carry it back and forth between the two classes. Uh, we're not supposed to use unit two at all. That's not a sign. Unit three is for English. Unit four is mine again. No one's teaching unit five. And then unit six is gonna be English. So that is two huge sections of this book that no one in Hillsborough County is going to use. We're all gonna throw it away. Um, that brings me over to other waste, um, particularly that we are not paying our teachers. Um, so if we go to our annual raises of 4%, as in Addison Davis's contract, that he said last time we were here that he would not accept the raise if we do not get raises. If 4% is the expected amount, then where's our 4%? Right now I'm looking at, as a person in seven years, I'm looking at a $300 increase. Not per paycheck, total. Y'all want to offer me $300 total. Now, as tax at 22%, uh, which is a uh, take home of $234, which is not quite enough to cover one week of preschool for my daughter, which I mentioned last time she was here. She had a great time. Um, it's really disheartening. And I would like for you guys to do better. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Kelly Champion Sith, uh, Smith Gaither. Um, I would like to mainly address, um, my primary concern is safety and security. Um, I would like to address the fact that my colleagues and I, um, between the fine arts, PE, and ag, our class sizes are, one is 63. I have a class size of 51, my colleague 51. I have 46, 47. Um, we did address T-Pay. We were told that we could not have a T-Pay. Um, so that it's not available. So I implore you to stop in there. Also, we're being asked from the district to give back units. Okay, we, we don't have anything to give back. Our classes are packed. It's a safety and security. Um, I can only, I've, the ag teacher and I talk all the time. We, there are things that she cannot control 63 students at one time. I cannot control 51 in a gym at one time. We cannot look at all of that at one time. Things go on, injuries happen. At this point, those injuries are gonna be the district's fault, not the teachers. The, the class of sizes are just, they're ridiculous, okay? Um, if you go back to like auto, I can't imagine how many students that one teacher is supposed to teach in auto and for it to be a safe environment. Also, when going with the safe environment, um, my site location is one of the largest on a major highway with six lanes. Um, our ADA has requested many times to have fence around our site. 
Um, having a barrier between the street and our site is, an, is, is a huge safety issue. It's been denied. Last year, I had to tackle an ESE student in the ditch that didn't have the cognitive ability to realize that they were running into six lanes of traffic. If I didn't tackle that child, he was probably going to get hit by a car. Um, we've asked, again, many, many times for a fence. Also, our exterior doors to my classroom. They are the exterior doors that should always be locked. Students can come up and pull them open. Our ADA did her job. She is requesting maintenance. Maintenance is overwhelmed. That door stayed open for four school days. At night, it was not locked either because it could not physically be shut. Say we've asked for a fence along that area as well. I understand fences do not stop everything. They do deter things, okay? I worked at Chamberlain for seven years. That campus has fences three sides, six foot, all the way around. They have to come in the front. I've never, at my site now, there's a solid fence in the back. You can walk in almost three directions on my site. It is not safe. Um, I'm just asking that you think of our students first, class size and safety. Safety is supposed to be number one with everyone and we're not thinking about it. We're just being told no, no, no. Class size is a direct link to safety as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Reese Hannafin Hernandez and I'm a science teacher at Alonzo High School and I came with data. So from my instructional planning tool, year 2021, I had 150 total students. Year 21, 22, I had 185. This year I have 215. So I'm teaching 60 more students. I'm teaching two free classes and I have not gotten any raise in two years. And that is not fair. Oh, and I know that's happening across the district. It's also not right that I'm a 12 year teacher and someone out of college is making as much as I am right now. I am the teacher, kind of teacher you want to keep in the classroom. You can check my donor's shoes profile. I bring in thousands to my classroom. I have several other teachers doing that now because I am. I go to professional development opportunities. I got accepted to one at the University of Florida and I got to do archeology span right, with the college. It was fantastic and I bring that into the classroom. Right, two people at my school who are excellent teachers have already said they're leaving this district. Right, because of the pay shortage right, and the overcrowded classes. Right, one in particular brought up that she no longer has to stay because now her uh, student loans are being forgiven. So you can have all the programs you want, but if you don't have happy, good teachers, they're not gonna do well. So the teachers are gonna make the success. And on top of it, we have a tremendous amount of pressure from the district and from the state to be A schools, but we're teaching extra classes for free and not being paid for it. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker tonight. Hi, Heidi Glick, Alonzo High School. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate Ms. Perez and Dr. Hahn on your reelection. That shows that our voters have faith in you that you will do what's right for Hillsborough County Public Schools. You will do what is right for Hillsborough County Public School students. And of course, you will do what is right for Hillsborough County Public School employees. I recently read an article in the Tampa Day Times that said the teacher shortage was not as bad as previously thought. So I got really curious about that and I went on our website, hillsboroughschools.org. Adams needs 14 teachers, Armwood 15, Blake 21, Brandon 19, Buchanan 11, Dobie 12, East Bay 12, Eisenhower 19, Foster 10, Gaither 27, Gunta 13, I don't know how to pronounce this one, I-P-P-D-I-T-O, needs 23, Jennings 11, Just Elementary 13, Kimball 14, Lamb 14, Mango 11, Marshall 10, Middleton 11, Ruskin 10, Schmidt 2, Spoto 13, Steinbrenner 13, Wharton 13, Young Middle Magnet 15. Why is this not an emergency? There are 571 altogether, 25 school counselors. There are 223 schools on that list. I'm really, really confused. What constitutes an emergency? I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm curious. I don't know what you guys are thinking anymore. Um, do you know how parents and students are going to feel about this? I have 189 students. Most people in most schools have well over 200. Um, and I'm just kind of curious 
I don't know how much oversight we do of the charter schools, but I'd really like to know how short our charter schools are on their certified school teachers to know where we are sending our students and we are short our enrollment and perhaps it's because they're going to charter schools that keep getting approved. Good evening. Thank you and thank you to all the employees who came this evening and that concludes our, our employee input. We will now move on to continuing our agenda. We will now move on to 303 State of Florida Statewide Voluntary Pre-K Provider Contract with Early Learning Coalition of Hillsborough County Schools, the EL, ELCHC for 2022-2023. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is just to recognize our relationship with the Early Learning Coalition of Hillsborough County. They gracefully provide $3 million to us as a school district to be able to address and offer a continued VPK. We know that uh, right now our kindergarten readiness level is around 48%, but we know that students who go to pre-K uh, programs and transition to kindergarten have a success rate of uh, 61, a readiness rate of 61.9%. So being able to allow and, and continue to partnership because one thing, the maximum hours of uh, that students can be engaged in during the school year is around 540, and then summer is around 300. And just just an opportunity for us to offer blended VPK classrooms, uh, Title I VPK classrooms, or, and also VPK migrant and summer VPK classrooms as well. So this will impact you know around 1,600 plus students within our school district, and continue to highlight what they do as they partner with us every day. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-303. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do, thank you. Um, I understand that this is essentially just a pass through for us, um, but since you've highlighted that this is our relationship with the Early Learning Coalition, i just like to use this as an opportunity to say that I hope that our relationship grows. There are several board members who have expressed repeatedly our passion for early learning, um, as well as making sure that our children have reading readiness by the time they enter even kindergarten and first grade and we've identified that some of our challenges is making sure that our students are reading on level and I think that we, we as a board have identified how important it is to make sure that we're preparing our students with reading readiness early on and I think that making sure that we're engaging talking with um, using every opportunity to strengthen our relationship with the early learning coalition to see best practices you know what their private daycares are doing what we're doing how we can you know um, share best practices with each other anything that we can do to work with this organization to make sure that our students are coming in prepared and given the most opportunity to be reading on level as possible I think is important so thank you thank you member Vaughn please vote when your lights appear and it passes unanimously. 501, addendum to the memorandum of agreement with 3DE Florida LLC and Junior Achievement of Tampa Bay for the design and implementation of 3DE model at selected high schools. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. In 2019, the school board approved to champion Hillsborough High School and Chamberlain High School to transition to partner with Junior Achievement and Richard George is here this evening to have an awesome 3DE program. This is an opportunity to have a cross curricular model to build entrepreneurships and really give students a problem of practice linking to local agencies uh, within, within our particular region. And we see that uh, Hillsborough High School and Chamberlain have done a beautiful job. Hillsborough High School serves around 294 students and Chamberlain serves over uh, 390 students at their particular schools. We see that when you look at attendance rates and also when you look at performance rates, students who are involved in the 3DE process outperform students who are not engaged in this process. And we see that we have great excitement, not only from the practitioner side for teachers, but great excitement from our students and our parents. And more students want to be actively engaged in this process. We have a number of local um, uh, community members that are helping us because uh, Junior Cheese, while we launch this and stand this process up, covers around 90% of this initiative. And from our side of it, 
we are paying around $740,000 in as we expand, not only for Hillsborough High School and Chamberlain High School, as we expand from Blake and also Plant City High School as well. If you haven't been in one of these classrooms, they're beautiful. I know most of us have been. And uh, it's a great way to be able to get our kids actively engaged and have a different inter you know, interdisciplinary pedagogy, relevant content for them to excel every single day. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion a second to approve item C501. I have a motion by Member Gray, and I have a second by Member Hahn. Member Gray, you pull this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, I, I, I do see Richard George in the audience. I want to thank uh, um, certainly our teachers are responsible for the gains uh, that we see so notably in Ch at Chamberlain and Hillsborough. But I also want to thank J.A. Um, Richard George, director, and Alex Sink, CEO, and, uh, and their staff. Um, those data points, Superintendent Davis, that you shared partially, um, you know, I have here 51 percent at Chamberlain had a higher attendance um, <clears throat> throughout the school year uh, versus their non-3DE peers. Now, attendance is the number one um, prerequisite of a successful student and a successful employee. I think uh, Member Snively will agree. Um, and learning those skills of showing up uh, is, of uh, course, we take it for granted, but is a very hard um, barrier for some of our students uh, with transportation and other barriers. However, uh, that's just one uh, data point at Chamberlain, 100% outperformed on the state assessments versus um, the non <coughs> three DE peers, uh, and, and we're reminded that we're talking with uh, the 9th, 10th, and 11th, let me make sure, yeah, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and I believe at Chamberlain we can go up to, uh, we have 395 now, and we can go up to 500, right? Yes, so uh, in second school, <clears throat> Hillsborough High, Gary Brady's former school, 13% um, higher attendance versus the non three DE. And 75% of the students outperformed on the state assess assessments. And those figures, and I'm looking at an intern from USF, uh, you probably can appreciate that very much. Um, <clears throat> and, and again, we're totaling now um, among the 9th, 10th, and 11th, 294 students at uh, Hillsborough, and we can go up to 500. All this is to say, I uh, want to say appreciation big time to, um, again, our guest, Richard George, but also Superintendent Davis for, thankfully, for ga gaining more traction in the world of 3DE from junior achievement. So those were my comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Combs. I just want to say how wonderful it is when I meet students who are in these programs across our district and they talk about the powerful impact on their self-esteem, on their public speaking skills, on their academic skills that these programs have had. They talk about the transformation that has taken place as they've grown as a student, as a young adult, how it's preparing them for workforce or college, whatever their goals and dreams are. And it's, it's you know, I encourage you to go out and visit these programs, talk to these students. And you know the, the program also connects them to business leaders in the community. It expands internship opportunities and mentoring. Um, so it's just such, it, it's a game changer for so, so many of our students. I'm excited to support this and I'm really excited to see this expand uh, in the future. Thank you, Member Hahn. And, and I wanted to echo the same sentiments um, as the other members. I mean, I, last year I was with Miss Lewis at Hillsborough High School and we team taught, I mean, we, we team taught um, a lesson regarding 3DE and how it's so hard to make decisions on the school board. And I gave the students several scenarios that we were dealing with then. It was just amazing to see the way they work together in the classroom. And I promised her I would go back out there this year because there's always lots of hot issues on the board that kids can understand how they're making those decisions. And I was able also to participate 
um, on a business call where I saw individuals coming up with business concepts and selling them. So overall, just the impact of 3DE, my, my question is how can we continue to expand this program? Because I think when you see high school, I mean, colleges now offering degrees in entrepreneurship, those kids are coming in so far ahead of the other students through this program. So I just really want to say how amazing I think the program is, and I'm glad to see the expansion, and I can see that it's really making such an impact in, with our students. And I want to thank all those teachers who go out there and do so much extra for the 3DE program. You can see from the coaches to the teachers that it requires so much additional work that our teachers do, and how appreciative I, how appreciative I am of that. Thank you. Uh, Member Perez? Okay, I'm going to deflate the balloon here for a moment. Okay, it's okay. Deflate. So it's general funds. Is there any other place that we could get 760000 from? I'm just saying. Yes, Mr. The Chair. Um, my understanding is we're going to use general funds is going to be used through SAI, which is ultimately be able to build, uh, to to be able to use and leverage resources in initiatives such as this. So this is all about having uh, academic interventions. This is an academic intervention to be able to expand knowledge in the same way that you know I should have took Dr. Han on the road. She did a really good job of explaining this process, but uh, it's uh, definitely an opportunity for us to expand having uh, accessibility to to our communities. To to our businesses, to our agencies, and, and internships, apprenticeships, so it's going to be well. Okay, but the, there's no other funding source? No, ma'am, other than SAI and general funds, that process. Okay, I mean, it's a great program, and our children need it, you know, in our schools. Um, it's a big ticket item, but, you know, I just, I just asked. I'm the one who always asks if there's another path, you know, to funding um, sources, but, uh, okay, I'm just wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, Mr. George, could you please stand up and be recognized? Since you've been such a patient participant in the audience, um, I apologize. If I, if I would have seen you earlier, I would have asked the chair to move your agenda item up to the top. So. Um, so, so sorry, but I want to thank you for everything that you do and you represent in the community for junior achievement and want to thank you for um, the expansion and advocating for the expansion of this really important program. And some of my colleagues have already mentioned how um, impactful it can be to students in, in various ways, whether it's a, a attendance or um, learning real world skills with real world companies and leaders of those companies and the amazing experiences that students can have that really do prepare them for a global economy, not just national, but global as well. So um, I too, always concerned. I think I appreciate your question, Member Perez. I appreciate that. I wish there was um, there were other uh, ways we could pay for this. I wish that um, I don't know if there's a way to, because I, because I would like to con continue to see the expansion in other schools aside from the four now that we'll have. So, um, so I task the superintendent and his team to be creative if there's um uh, if there's another way. Uh, and and I know Mr. George can be instrumental in in that as well. And looking at because this is not just something in Florida. Obviously, this is in how many more st how many other states it's like eight states. So there's eight states. Um, I'd like to I'd like the superintendent to explore um, any creative options that the other eight states may use in um, helping to fund this. But um, and then again, um, I won't be here a year from now. But. <laughs> Stop it. Um, <laughs> but um, I, char I challenge the board to um, see or ask for, you know, what kind of results are we getting? Let's, let's get some, some data around uh, that attendance yeah. that you, you come in. I'd like to see, you know, I think board members would like to see some of that, um, how it's really impacted students. Uh, on, in a positive way. So let's see some data around it. To, that way, when you have something that comes from the general fund like this, we at least have some, some solid substantiation of why we're investing these dollars into our students like this, for, you know, for this particular 
um, initiative. So, but thank you um, for investing in the students and um, looking forward to see the positive effects of this um, around the school district and in the economy. Thanks. Yes, ma'am, and, and I will say this. Uh, I will send uh, some analytics that we have, and Ms. Gray did a really, really good job identifying all the, the information related to positive impact along with, with Mrs. Cones, but I can send that to the board. And I know that we're waiting for continued, that you'll see what we have at uh, comparison potentially of what we have not only surrounding counties but throughout the nation. Mr. George is very competitive, and uh, it rubs off on us. But this is a great initiative, and we'll see if there's any additional do dollars. And, and remind you that Junior Achieve they pay for 90% of the stand-up, and this is about marketing, selecting students, uh, professional development, on-site, JA leader at the school, and at the same token, being able to have a lead teacher to drive this initiative. So it's um, been a great return on investment. So I'll send that. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Gray? I don't have much more to say other than, um, you know, we plan, I hope, to expand this program and what member snively said about you know the eclectic ways of funding and i know uh, mr george we've talked about this before how can we get funding i think we should explore that superintendent davis i would really because the future is what uh, all the board members have shared um on the day is the future is with our students, and, and, and this to me shares and shows the, a successful trend. Uh, that's putting it in a, in a very small way. It's huge what these students are doing and what, what skills they're attaining. So uh, I appreciate what Member Snively is saying about we need to find the, the, a good s source of funds so we can expand this in more schools. So um, yes, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 901 sole source purchase from Imagine Learning and Literacy by Imagine Learning for 2022-2023 school year. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for us to continue to have a digital educational platform that targets literacy instruction and at the same time simultaneously addresses first language uh, supports for 15 different languages for our students that transition to our school district. So this is all to be about emerging and developing ELL students within our district. This is about literacy uh, language support. And at the same token, we are leveraging extra three dollars to be able to purchase this to serve our, our students. And this is reused around 107 sites that we currently have. And this is some of our students, uh, some of our schools that have such rich um, diversity. We want to be able to make certain we connect with our students along the way so we can see and continue to have uh, progression uh, by using this instrument. If we look at data provided in this particular item, you see that students who were engaged in Imagine Learning had outperformed others, and it will continue to be something that we continue to support and provide ongoing professional development. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second, to approve item C901. I have a motion by Member Washington, and I have a second by Member Gray. Member Gray and I pulled this item. Do you have any questions, Member Gray? Then. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a few remarks. We talk about the importance of data. Well, the ELL, silent but very effective, um, and Elena Garcia is not here to thank uh, personally, but we do have Monica Vera Torado who um, knows that the English language arts, the, this very grant um, showed, and, and I don't want to bore everybody, but it is impressive, 3% uh, uh, were up last year and lost no ground over the last four years. The math went up 6% from last year and up 2% over a four-year period, and the math gains we're up to 14% from last year and 5% over a four-year period. So the, the point is the ELL total had learning gains of 5.85, and the ones who did not participate in the elevation and uh, imaging were at 3.42%. So 5.85 for those who got the Imagine Learning and 3.42 who did not. So 
we're we're looking at a really great um, amount of data points that show this investment from well Esser, Esser and grants were very in Title III um, were very well utilized and uh, and these students are gaining ground. So that's all I have to say on that. I don't know if anyone wants to expand on it or not, but uh, just wanted to give a shout out for this program. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. And I had uh, quite a few questions with Ms. Garcia, and she really, a lot of them had to do with the funding source, and she was able to clarify that with the ESSER funding as well as Title III. And also just looking at the gains, our ELL students are just doing amazing across the board. I mean, even today, this morning, I was at Woodbridge Elementary where they're doing a dual language program. We are really seeing that our ELL, our dual language programs, those students continue to do so well. So obviously, I'm going to support this program, and I appreciate Ms. Garcia and um, Ms. Dr. Vera Torado providing all that information as well. Um, if Member Vaughn, you had questions? Thank you. Yeah, I was. I, I, I have questions about the funding, so since yeah. she got some clarification on it. Um, for the private schools and charter schools, is that money that we would normally give to them that we're earmarking for this? Or I haven't seen an agenda item come forward with ESSER funds where we split some for charter schools and private schools. So can you help me understand the funding for that? Yes, ma'am. For clarification in here, it should not include charter schools. It's a good question. This is only, we, while charter schools do get their portion of ESSER $3, that are trans and ESSER dollars are transitioned to them. They are they have their own responsibility of purchasing their curriculum and being able to identify what resources they believe to be best. Uh, and I believe this is identified in our uh, agenda item in the financial impact. However, it, it is our role responsibility is to be able to help private schools. They do have a pass through, and we are able to have a pass through to purchase a, you know content for them. But charter schools are not inclusive in that process. So we'll make certain that we don't want to change the item. We just wanted to thank you for asking the question because I wanted to make certain that um, we address that this evening. But they are not inclusive of that process. Did you have something you wanted to say? May I add a little bit of clarification, sure, Superintendent? Yes. Thank you. So um, you're you're right on target. I think what a piece that can be a little bit confusing is with the federal funds. And you'll notice it lists ESSER and then Title III. So Title III is a longstanding um, uh, federal program. So obviously, we, we are required to have uh, private school participation, and they have they they all of our federal programs. We have to have um, a way for our private schools to participate, and charter schools also have to partici ha uh, participate in our in our federal programs. And so um, uh, the attempt here from um, Elena Garcia was to show um, how how these various schools and students. Are going to are participating in the federal program now. What to the superintendent's point is the charter schools get a portion of the, the funds, um, and but they have the ability to be reimbursed out of the federal funds. So that's what we anticipate for those charter schools that choose to participate. And imagine based on what they have um, indicated that they will be if they they will then be reimbursed after they make their purchase um, through the Title Three dollars. So I'm sorry, because you said this was explained in the financial impact, and that's the piece that I'm looking at. So when we say expense account ESSERs for our portion, the 348000 that's the amount that we're paying towards that. The Title Three, when you say private schools, the 22000 that's money that we're paying for the private schools to participate. That's money that they're paying. I'm confused. That about is that money that the federal government we're passed through. So, right. so every every student in 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 um, Hillsborough County has access to participate in federal programs, right? So, they, if they're a private school, charter school, or a traditional public school. So this is not different than any of our other federal grants. So they, they have identified they want to spend that pass-through money on that's, this? That's correct. Okay. And we can't give them. That's another thing that we have to be clear. We can't give them money. That's not a good idea anyway. We, can, we, we partner with them through the consultation process and provide service, et cetera, so that we can be sure about the money that we are passing through that it's going to, going to really get to the students. So when you got to the charter school amount, um, you're saying that they have identified they want to use this program and you anticipate the federal fund will pass that through and That's we will correct. have that $4,500 to use towards this purchase? That's correct, yes. Okay, if for some reason they don't get refunded on that, is that something that will then come out of our funding? Or if we say I anticipate, like, what what happens if for some reason? No, then we just, we wouldn't be in, um, incurring that cost. In, in, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. I had many of the similar questions, and I, I spoke to Ms. Garcia quite a, quite a bit about that, um, and Superintendent Davis. Thank you. Um, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 903, sole source, 22233, SSD. SK Attainment Company, Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. Attainment Company is one of the lead, national leaders in curriculum development for students with significant cognitive disabilities. Uh, they provide uh, openly scope and sequence of resources for our uh, for students. They, it is aligned to our new state standards. And at the same token, it is also research-based and it embeds a progress monitoring tool within this process. And this allows us to be able to serve students who have, uh, you know, access points. It allows us to use this as the core. And at the same token, being able to use this as an alternative assessment for students as they have to have an assessment identified by the state of Florida. We see this being used in Miami, Palm Beach, Duval County, Orange County, and Broward County as well. And we will leverage categorical IDEA funding to be able to purchase this thank you superintendent davis i need a motion a second to approve item c903 i have a motion by member perez and i have a second by member snively member vaughn you pulled this item do you have any questions or comments uh, i don't i got a lot of my questions answered i just want to clarify and i thought it was interesting so these are because now we have new access point standards from the best standards which were not rolled out at the same time as the best standards there was a lag in making sure that we had the standards for our our disabled our, our students who have been identified disabled through the chair through the, uh, yes. <laughs> yes that's correct we okay did, thank you thank you member vaughn please vote when your lights appear And it passes unanimously. 904 Soul Source 22216 SSD IV Brainspring Orton Gillian, Gillian, Gillian Professional Development. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is a five day training for VE teachers really to focus on literacy and the phonics readiness level. This is for interventions for students who have reading disabilities or any student that has uh, been identified of having dyslexia. So this is another wraparound service. This has been implemented since 2018, 2019 in Hillsborough County and just continue to service using and leveraging IDEA funds to do so. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C904. I have a motion by Member Snively and I have a second by Member Perez. Member Snively, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. I probably more pulled this to highlight it than to ask questions because most of my questions did get answered by the superintendent and his team. But um, I just wanted to, to thank you. Over the years, um, I have had parents reach out to me with concerns about dyslexia and what our district is doing to help identify students who have reading disabilities or dyslexia and what we're doing to help students. And so, um, so anytime there's an initiative like this uh, on our agenda, that helps um, our students or helps identify them, helps helps t them to improve their academic performance. Um, is, is this another wraparound service that we offer to our children? Um, I just like to highlight that to let the parents uh, know out there that we are continually continuously looking for ways that we can um, help our students with reading disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. Member Gray? Yeah, I just had a curious question. Uh, is this part of the SIPs when we bought the uh, phonics program, or this is totally not part of that? Yes, ma'am, this is not part of the SIPs program. SIPs is a... S-I-P-P-S. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am, the SIPs is uh, for Tier 1 for every student within the school district to really focus on the phonics and foundational skills of literacy. But this just drills deeper for an intervention for students who may have greater complexities for Tier 2 or particular Tier 3 to be able to service them. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 1001, invitation to bid 22169 DST CH random access memory chips. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is for us uh, to be able to continue to move forward with um, our repairs and technology to be able to increase our memory on our computer computers. This is a eighty thousand dollar expenditure using leverage in general fund. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. 
I need a motion and a second to approve item C, 1001. I have a motion by Member Hahn, and I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Member Vaughn? Yeah, um, I just wanted to make a comment um, about 1001, 1002, and 1003. Um, all three of them, I, I, I understand we have this conversation quite um, often, how important technology is through our district. But since all three of these are coming out of the general fund through quite an expense, expensive um, to incur, coming to about $4.5 million dollars, through these three items just alone, when that's one third of a step, um, I'm just gonna have to vote no on these items going forward and I just wanted to be clear on why I'd be voting no on these next three items. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Gray? <clears throat> I um, also have to share the, um, I have doubts right now because I don't see uh, this expenditure being part of a technology plan, which I requested over six times from um, Dr. Weeks. Um, and I also am reminded that any expenditure above and beyond uh, what is absolutely necessary to, uh, that that is above and beyond the one-to-one, -one. every child does not have a one-to-one -one computer yet. Uh, and. Turkey Creek and other parts of the district do not have um, the services in terms of the Wi-Fi connections. So I would I would defer to make sure that we are doing our basics for technology before we start dressing up and going further. I, I will also say if there is a, a strategic plan, uh, this is part of a strategic plan. I haven't seen that as well. So I, um, I can't support this particular agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. I know Superintendent Davis, you wanted to make some comments? Ms. Perez. Perez. Oh, I thought, okay, yes, I'm sorry. Member Perez? Yeah, and we've had some techno technology um, items come up on almost every agenda that we've had. Um, and it's, it's been at a quite a cost. So I have as well some concerns. I think Superintendent Davis, you wanted to make a comment on several of these items and yes, then. So definitely, without a doubt, you know, one of the questions was, what's the technology? We have been really been accelerating technology in the last two and a half years. Uh, upon entry, we were at uh, six to one ratio between devices and students, and now we're at a two to one, and we have aspirations to go one to one, but we gotta be able to have funding to do that. And we've been leveraging a number of ESSER dollars, a number of capital dollars to be able to, to make certain that that is a reality. Um, you know, but one thing we, when we look at this particular item, this is all about being able to cover our units as they transition out of warranty to give them the memory they need so they're functional until we can get brand new uh, items in front of them. I've also met with uh, Dr. Weeks uh, for a number of weeks to be able to review his technology plan. It is finally finalized and uh, I'll be able to share with the board and I'm gonna ask Dr. Weeks to meet with each of you as well to be able to go and identify what our aspirations are and how are you going to continue to leverage money. A lot of the funding that has come to, and I would say particularly chopped up, is more about the timing of the agenda item related to being able to cover um, you know, data breaches, to be able to have storage, to be able to look at memory, accessibility, digital platforms, all those elements are definitely needed when you're talking about running a, a $3.3 billion organization serving 220,000 students and close to 25,000 employees. So this is an $80,000 expenditure that um, we, we definitely need or I would not have brought to the board. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Gray, were you done with your comments? I had one more. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is that okay? Madam yes. Chair? Yes. Um, so the number one priority, and, and this goes back to 2016, 17, 18, 19, we are very behind in our technology. There's no question. We are probably over a decade behind. That's putting it mildly. And, and I know only too well that unless we giddy up and get going, um, and, and you've been very uh, aggressive in this, uh, Superintendent Davis, and I appreciate that. I would ordinarily say yes, and I would support it, 
but until I get requested material from the strategic plan that it is inherent, and until I get a plan, I've been saying yes, yes, yes to almost every technological expenditure. But when I find out, for example, Williams uh, Element, uh, Williams Magnet IB program, school, Williams School, excuse me, has one to three computers. This is an IB uh, school, and then the neighboring school has one to one. I, I have to question why aren't we at least doing an audit so those who have too much uh, can share with those who have too little. That would be number one, which I asked Mr. Farkas for an audit a while back. And secondly, until I see a plan, and, and I mean, it's to me, it's like I'm spending money, but I don't see a holistic uh, plan to that we're working towards an end goal. And it, it's hard for me to I'll speak as an individual board member to to keep spending money unless I know it's uh, coming to a a point of, of finality. But that's that's just where I'm at right now. Thank you. Thank you, um, Member Gray. Member, did you want to say something? Just Would you more. allow Mr. Superintendent? All right. Superintendent, go uh, ahead. I gratefully appreciate it. Uh, we do have a, you know, you may see one, some schools have greater one-to-one -one devices than other because there's different funding sources that schools have. Schools have uh, tiered approaches, whether it be Title I funding, whether it be UNISIC funding, turnaround funding, and, and openly there's some schools that have some really robust PTAs that are generating money, and I'm talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars that they use to be able to uh, to ad address the I would say equipment gap that this district has had for many years. So, you know, now we're starting to play catch up. So we can't, we, if there's funding that is being identified or leveraged in a categorical from one school, we can't move that equipment from one school to the next because it's tied to that inventory list. So we are working diligently to get that ratio down and being able to discover what the new classroom should look like as the next five to 10 years for that visionary process. So we do have an, uh, an open, uh, collection of how many units, whether they be uh, mobile units or desktop units at every one of our schools, and we can provide that information as I send the technology plan as well. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Snively? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will concur, well, a couple things. First, um, the Gibson Consulting Report, which we uh, haven't looked at really as a board, I think, in a, in a while, if at all, had a section about information technology. And I will agree with Member Gray, we were sore, sorely, sorely behind. And it was never a priority previously, honestly, um, to this school district to be, to spend any money on technology. So we're, we're literally more than a decade behind, I'd probably say two or three decades behind on on um, technology. But with that said, I would also like to see a, a strategic plan, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. We've been very, I think, yes, I think we've been very patient and we've been cooperative with um, the requests coming forward for expenditures on technology, and I think that. Um, uh, and, and obviously, we, we, we trust you, at least I, I, I trust you. I trust your judgment if you say you, you need um, supplies and equipment. Uh, however, we would at some point, I think as a board, like to see what is your vision for um, technology in our future, in our school district. And that way we have, we can also share your vision and apply your strategies to what you ultimately desire for for the school district and hopefully it aligns with what the board desires as well so uh, as soon as you can get that to board members i think the the more we can understand what your vision is and support hopefully continue to support your efforts and you know looking at these three items two are coming from the general fund and one is coming from esser and uh, the big one is coming from from federal funds um, and hopefully that continues to keep catch us up with where we need to be for our students benefit the question i had on 1001 and maybe 1002 also but on 1001 i noticed that the financial impact 
for the previous year was about $6,800, but this year it's 80000 And so I'd like to understand, um, as stated in the cover sheet, if financial impact is greater than 10% from the prior year, please explain why. And so I'd love to hear what um, your explanation is as to what why there is such a, a drastic cost change. I'm sure you, you, you'll be able to explain that. And then I will also ask, is that 80000 an estimate or is do we believe that maybe through the bidding process we would get something that's closer to previous year's expenditures? Through the chair, um, I'd like to say uh, first off, the $80,000 is an estimate. Uh, we've already gone out and uh, uh, secured bids. Basically, we had an ITB um, that was put in place. So we did have a bidder that came in uh, at the lowest cost, and that's the bidder that we're, we're choosing um, to utilize for the parts. Um, as for the total amount of the expenditure, again, that's just an estimate, and we don't, ex we don't expect that we're going to exceed that. We actually expect that we're going to come in below that, but I would rather take that amount to the board rather than having to come back uh, before the end of this fiscal year to seek additional funding. Uh, as for previous year expenditures, uh, you can see we had three years ago, yeah, three years ago, there was a significant expenditure. Over the last two years, we didn't have as much of an expenditure because we've been purchasing devices uh, for the past two years. So we have had repair parts that we've needed. However, this really only covers unwarranted devices. This helps us to catch up. Um, so as we move forward and continue to purchase devices, we're going to see this expenditure generally drop because our devices are going to be newer in age and they're generally going to be covered for warranty for the most of their, uh, their lifespan. So we should see this uh, in subsequent years dropping even further. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Snively. Superintendent Davis, I just yep. will pass that to you before I speak. Yes, ma'am. So, you know, I know these three items coming up are all technology related. If it would be better to couch all three of these items and be able to meet with the board members to review the technology plan, we could particularly do so. I don't know if there's anything. I mean, I think that, I mean, we meet next week. So if there's a potential to gain access to uh, over the next couple of days to review the plan, or we can even, we can push it to where you feel comfortable, but openly, you know, it'd be up to the board to make that determination. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Um, and just a, a couple comments um, I had myself. I know that I've had several members discuss having a possible workshop, a technology workshop. I've had three or four, so I, someone or will fill out the form or we'll, uh, I'll do it myself to really look at that. Or I know, yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, somebody will get it done this week as far as a workshop and a strategic plan. And, you know, Superintendent Davis, I did talk to you about my concern with 1003. You know, to me, you know, that's that's a little bit different than when we're talking about computers. My my only concern is I just don't want uh, for 1001 and 1002. It seems like those are the computers that we have now. One of them you're trying to make sure we have memory. The other ones that we have computer parts. My only hesitation is is that going to bottleneck or impact technology getting out to students? Because one and two seem like a need and, and 1003 seem like a want. Um, I just want clarification on that or do we want to wait and push those all out? So that's my question to you. So, you know, let Dr. Weeks kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but 1001, 1002 can pause for a little bit. It doesn't impact us getting information or equipment out to our students in any way, shape or form so they can interact. Um, 1002 is more about being able to have replacement for, you know, any type of our keyboards and, you know, hard drive, so power supplies, audio components, and we're at the early stages this year. So we know that as we start the year starts to transition, that we may need that you know quicker than you know sooner than later. But I think uh, as we interact, you, each of the board interacts with the technology plan and provides feedback to me and Dr. Weeks and our team, and actually the entire cabinet. We can strengthen it and have a better understanding and have better comfortability as we bring these items to the board for approval. Okay, so I just want to clarify: we can move all three items and just push them out then. So if, if that's the superintendent's that's recommendation, it, yeah. So yes. you, the board meets next week on okay. Thursday, and I think the superintendent could assess whether it's re these are ready to go forward based on the comments about having a, um, a comprehensive plan and making sure the board understands. So if that's the board's will, then you can someone could make a motion yes, to move 1001, 1002, and 1003 until next week, and then it could always be moved further back if it needs to. So that would be the appropriate motion. Okay, perfect. Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am. So what I would okay. say is that... Um, Next Thursday, I'm thinking about next Thursday, it may be too much time to be able to allow you to interact with the technology plan to provide feedback. So 
Um, we can couch these for the following meeting after uh, next Thursday and, uh, and then get, in, get feedback from the board and then strengthen it, and then it will be primed for after the following uh, meeting after next Thursday's meeting. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, who would like to, can I'll I take, make, I'll I make the motion? I can't make the motion. I'll move to uh, continue continue this these three items yeah, items until three. next Thursday well, until, until the superintendent brings them back. So it'll be the second meeting in until the board has a chance to review the technology st strategic plan. Thank you, Member Snively. Do we have a second? We have a second by Ms. Gray. Clear the board, please, so the board can vote. So right now, if you vote yes, that means that we will table it until the superintendent brings it at w what time that he that he is recommended. And if you vote no, that means you'd like to vote on that right now. So please vote when your lights appear. Yeah. And so that passes unanimously. We will take all three items off the agenda for this evening, and we will review the strategic plan, and then we will workshop it as well, and then we will get superintendent will bring these items back if needed at a later notice. Okay, thank you. We will now move on to superintendent comments. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much for flexibility, and uh, we always appreciate our team members working together in this process. We want to make sure we get it right, and we get feedback for continuously for the board. Before I start, I, I just want to be able to take a minute to acknowledge the teachers that came this evening. You know, tonight uh, I understand that uh, I can't put myself in the in the individual situations that teachers are in every single day. Why I visit as many classrooms as I can. I want every one of our educators to know that I take their voice and I take their concerns and, and embed them through my conversations with our team in effort to improve our school district every single day. So I appreciate and, and acknowledge that we can have opportunities to improve this process and uh, thankful for their time to be able to, uh, to interact this evening with us. But opening tonight's about where we'll take a chance to review our current enrollment, be able to provide district updates, identify a consent agenda, and then review consent uh, or suspended agenda, which tonight's suspended agenda will be focused on literacy. So a highlight that really focuses on all of our goals and our strategic plan is openly our enrollment. And our enrollment really drives our funding sources, bless you, and the same token being able to provide ongoing services that are unique to our school district and allows us to compete at a, uh, you know, a, a a local level, but also throughout a state and national level as well. When you look at the comparison data from you know day 14 to 21, 22 to 22, 23, you see that we are down in enrollment in the area of elementary and middle school. We do see a spike with K-8 and also high school. And this really shows an indication of how well we're doing in these two types of configurations. One of the things I'd like to explore as we move forward in our school district is expanding K-6s. And as parents spoke tonight in the Carrollwood community, you know, it gives our, our community members stability as they transition from elementary to middle school, and particularly being able to stay in that same umbrella and that same roof. And we look at virtual school, we see more students are transitioning back to our school district as relates to the virtual component and other where uptick related to looking at uh, career technical I mean, our vocational schools, adult schools, and also our alternative schools as well. And then charter schools are, are up, but make note that we expanded by four or five charter schools this particular school year. And then see an overall increase of 2,200 students within our school district. We'll continue to watch this as we tr navigate through the 20-day count and also get to the FTE window as we look at class size and make certain we address it along the way, which our team is doing a really good job. And also sales tax referendum is making certain that we are, uh, you know, fiscal responsible and looking at our operational goal for responsibility. One thing we want to be able to address is HVAC and, um, you know, that our, our August is our busiest month related to being able to serve HVAC with operations. You know, Kenetero, you know, we need about five Kenneteros and his team with Ben Moore and, and, and Chris. They take so many uh, maintenance requests, so many phone calls to be able to serve the, the growing needs. But also we want to recognize that August of this year, 2,300 service requests have come through our school district related to our HVAC request. And uh, we have to acknowledge, if you do that comparative analysis between 2018-2019, is we've reduced that number 37%, and this is all linked to 
the money that we receive from the half cent sales tax. And that money, majority of the money from the half cent sales tax that we've, uh, you know, referendum has really done to be addressed the HVAC replacement in our school district. As we look at the, the first four years of this referendum, we were able to replace 99 AC units in our school district. We see that another 15 will be champion uh, at the end of next school year. So the first five years of this referendum, we'll be able to acknowledge that either a full or partial um, your replacement of our HVAC systems in 114 of our schools. And then as we look at a 10-year continuum, being able to address 210 facilities within our school district. And one thing we want to understand is that we have 96 you know, a thousand pieces of HVAC within uh, within our school district that could potentially, you know, break or fail at any given moment. And we have to recognize that the conditions that we are living in, no different than our home. I've had many AC issues at my particular home in the last couple of years. And uh, we live in Florida and it's really hot. So our team has responded. We have 70, 72 crews that are suite of uh, HVAC engineers that serve our district every single day. And we have 16 fully staffed technicians that are deployed to be able to address and triage and many thanks to the teachers or staff that, that reach out to me and I'm able to connect and identify those uh, issues immediately but we continue to ask our schools to follow the protocols of updating our maintenance requests because our staff is working through that process every single day and, and if there is a classroom or a wing that's out and we don't know about it our team and operations team cannot triage it and they have been tremendously responsive in this process if we have particular wings or units or classrooms that are out you know our team and operations have been very responsive by putting temporary chillers or spot coolers within these particular locations to make certain that we have a comfortable environment not only for our students for our employees as well and we think we appreciate those our patients but we have i think it's 29 million square feet that we have to serve and and that we're addressing every single day which is significantly large but hats off to our team to be very responsive and hats off and hats off for being able to leverage the half cent to be able to re reduce you know, our, our analytics 37% by the great work that has taken place for the half cent. And then also, you know, while we're trying to continue to create strong schools, stronger Hillsborough County, you know, thank you to all of our community members that educated themselves on the referendum. And, uh, you know, we, we, we were so close, you know, 590 votes away in the early stages of this analytics, we were, there was greater separation. And uh, we thank everybody who was involved with, with HEF with a lot of our chambers and, and coordinated efforts to be at the table to be able to help us uh, be partners. You know, we will continue to uh, inform the communities and meet with our teams to do a biopsy of what we can do to get better and openly being able to champion this particular in 2024 as we move forward. And, and that starts today. It doesn't, we don't wait to, you know, four months away. We get better time, planning time to be able to be more efficient in that process and make certain that we have that continuous improvement mindset so we can get this down the field and get it across the finish line to be able to compete. And we know that Polk will be, Hillsborough and Polk will be the only two counties in the surrounding counties that does not have this to be able to build compensation packages. But I stand prepared to be able to listen to our board members, our community members, and look at particular precincts where it didn't pass to make certain that we uh, in, in this team is embedded in those communities to create better transparency and better trust so they feel comfortable enough to be able to move this to the finish line. And then also being able to listen tonight with the consent agenda item that we want to be able to acknowledge is our beautiful partnership that we have with the Children's Board of Hillsborough County. They invest programs and services for our family. Kelly Parrish is a true champion of, of our community and very responsive in this initiatives. And you look at all of the initiatives that they adopt for us with Boys and Girls Club, Metropolitan Ministries, you know, the... Um, uh, uh, big brothers, big sisters, being able to look at, you know, Mayan, how they have bring HEF on board with this process, seniors in service, and the list continues. But we want to recognize that this is money that we don't expend within our school district, that they identify and put resources, the wraparound resources that help our families and students obtain success every single day within our school district. And then we're going to transition to our suspended agenda. This is about literacy update, and Mr. Connor is going to lead this initiative. Good evening, board. I'm happy to share with you a little bit of what's going on in the world of literacy. The first thing I want to share with you is our Helios grant that we were just awarded uh, with partnership with the Hillsborough Education Foundation. We're proud to say that we received $1.3 million for the next three years 
to help fund three to four coaches in 12 of our transformation schools with the goal <clears throat> of closing the achievement gap. Also, we're very excited about our pre-K letters videos. This has really been the brainchild of one of our board members, Ms. Nadia Combs, who has really pushed our team to work diligently to create 26 videos to support pre-K and kindergartners student learning with their letters, their sounds, and uh, additional phonic skills. We used our communications videography team and used um, a lot of our uh, best practices in terms of teaching our uh, students all about the different foundational skills and also using some very familiar community places, including our very own elementary schools, to highlight some of the uh, greater aspects of our community. We're also very excited about our Future Career Academy. Our ELA department is partnering with uh, CTE and Yvonne Fry from our Future Career Academies to develop and implement career exploration and readiness lessons to better prepare our students for life after high school. So students starting in the 12th grade, uh, English classes are gonna learn about resume writing, budgeting, interviewing skills, and about various skills each employee seeks in a candidate. So we're really excited about that. We've created some fun videos that highlight uh, some of the aspects with our principals as well as local industry related videos that will be shared as students take part of this curriculum and students will also be engaging in a self-assessment reflection through various industries represented right here in Tampa as they prepare for business um, and field trips and future fairs and signing days. Thank you, Mr. Connor, for identifying what we continue to do for literacy. And I know that uh, we wanted to, we had continued effort in meetings with local delegations and, and Mayor Castro the other day that talked about you know finding ways to bridge you know a greater concentration at literacy, not only in isolation as a school district, but how the city can be a, a partner in this work. And then at the same token, we want to make certain that I take the time to acknowledge that uh, Labor Day is coming up. And we want everyone to you know, continue to be champions the, the, the next three days, but be able to have that balance in life and take time to really enjoy themselves and family and to step away and re-energize as we continue to come back. And uh, you know, I've been at many schools over the last uh, couple weeks. I see outstanding instruction taking place. I always try to post it on our social media. But kids are actively engaged, they're facilitating the learning, teachers are teaching with, uh, with great spirits, uh, students are well behaved, and uh, it's just all about putting systems and controls in place. And you see and start to feel that the school district is moving on the hills of being identified as an A school district as we move forward. So thank you for everyone for their hard work and their support, and we'll continue to be innovative in our solutions to create the best places. And thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Washington. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I would like to congratulate Member Hahn and Member Perez on your victory. Glad to have you back. Um, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Gary Adult. Gary Adult School has a resource room now where they are furnishing uh, clothing as well as food to the community. But one of the, one of the things that was very important and unique about Gary Adult was they have a drone class, so it's something totally different. They have me, they had me flying drones, and I don't, you know, he was going all over the place, but I enjoyed doing it. But uh, yeah, they're doing a really good job. They have a lot of opportunities for students at Gary Adult. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Collins for coming out to the 100 Black Men. You had a wonderful presentation last weekend, and and the fellows were teasing. They say, "Shake, we thought." We thought you brought the guy to join the 100 black men, but you did a great job. You did a great job. Yeah, that's right. We'll make your honor. That's right. We'll do that. We'll do that. Also, I had opportunity to go to Brandon, Brandon High School with Lauren Leto. Lauren Leto is a, Brandon is a community school now, and she is a go-getter. She's from that area. Uh, she was a great softball player at, at, uh, Armwood. And most people in that area know Lauren. Uh, great visit. Um, ha she has a lot of support. And, uh, and that's important to have for Brandon High School. And, and Mr. J uh, Jeremy is doing a great job. The principal is doing a great job over there. We also, I've been working on, um, back to the 100 black men. I've been working on partnerships. Hopefully we can, uh, 
get them to come out and be partnered with us so we can have a mentoring program. So we're trying to get a mentoring program with the 100 black men. We also, we also in, are in the process of I mean, working with the University of South Florida Athletic Department to see if we can get a partnership with USF, with the athletes coming out to three schools. Uh, and I was telling, uh, it's Pizio, Greco, and King High School. Um, having the athletes to come out and mentor those kids, because I think that's important. I think we may have an inside tri track on that. Um, so also, um, partnership with the Career Resource Tampa Bay. We met with Ms. Jones uh, and uh, Dr. Clayton. We always, we are always trying to build partnerships so we can build up the community and help the kids in the community. And last but not least, um, we, they had a mural uh, drawn over at uh, Edison. Beautiful. The Eagles. And uh, it was real nice. We had a lot of uh, students participate coming out. They were speaking. And by the way, I promised to give them an ice cream party, so I got to keep up with that. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But anyway, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Perez? Yes, I want to um, talk for a moment, you know, um, about the, the Cuban students that are coming in to the district. Um, in 2020, I had the amazing opportunity to go to Cuba for two weeks. Um, and I went to Cuba purposefully to learn a little bit about, um, you know, the, the Cuban um, people and, and, and what they went through and what they're going through. Um, I have some, some pictures. Um, so when I, when, I, when I landed in Cuba, I disembarked and got off the plane on the tarmac. And when I walked through the airport, I, I left the airport, and it, I felt like I went back in time. Literally, it took me back to the 1940s. There was no car in Cuba that was older than 1950 or 60. And... The family that I was with roasted a pig, a small pig, for me at 3 o'clock in the morning. And the reason why they roasted that pig for me at 3 o'clock in the morning is because had they done it any other time, they, they could have been arrested and inc incarcerated for 10 years. We drove around the island one day looking for three cups of oil and it literally took us four hours. I stood in line with this family to get a loaf of bread for two hours, and by the time we got there, there was no bread left. I say that to say that our Cuban students that are here now have experienced a lot of trauma. And as we welcome these Cuban students here, we need to let them know how excited we are to have them here. But we also have to understand how scared, confused, and they're attempting to acculturate to our way of life. And what I'm asking all us board members, but also this amazing community that we call Hillsborough County, is to help assist and support our new community members. That's all I ask. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Gray? Yes, uh, and I want to thank Superintendent Davis for highlighting the Children's Board. Uh, they do so very much, and thank you, Kelly Paris, wherever you may be. But. Uh, uh, for the high needs and the children that, uh, and the families, especially the families that have very little uh, voice and uh, in supplies and needs, uh, the children's board really uh, fills the void. Uh, I want to express my appreciation for the challenging yet comprehensive job of trying to get our requested increase of millage passed. This appreciation includes our Tampa Bay communities, HEF, Hillsborough Education Foundation, the CTA, board members, and Superintendent Davis. 
It is evident our board plus Superintendent Davis have more work to do in terms of gaining public trust with our monetary expenditures. However, I am confident we will meet this challenge. Meanwhile, our hardworking teachers, paras, and entire Hillsborough County Public School staff deserve recognition and gratitude for their continuous work in keeping our students safe in our schools, well-educated, and mentally and socially supported. So uh, just a little bit of a highlight. Always, I, I hate to say closure, but in a way, I think we have to have closure at this point in time. So, um, Member Perez, I was also in Cuba a few years ago, believe it or not, running a race. So I know all about the 1950s cars and their emissions, because I almost choked to death while I was running. Uh, yeah, I can't put it any other way. Um, but we did stay there a few weeks. Um, and uh, their number one emphasis was literacy and the need for, I think I said this before, the need for uh, running shoes in, in the category I was involved in. Um, regarding the, uh, the, the Cuban population coming to our uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools, and Ms. Monica, you will get a lot of credit um, for setting up the systems to welcome our Cuban uh, students and the families. Um, these are these children are coming from Latin America and the Caribbean, and we're reminded that perhaps by the um, maybe a half of the year this year we may be up to over forty percent of a Hispanic uh, population that are students in our in our district. So we do pay attention. Um, one of the things that I want to say is that. Um, Principal Larissa McCoy deserves a lot of credit at Leto High School. She had single-handedly uh, not only the first day of school, but all of the uh, new um, new registrants, to put it kind of loosely. Uh, she had to integrate them into her s school system, and I just know that uh, Member Combs was very aware um, that she did a fabulous job. Um, and wherever you are, Ms. McCoy, Super Kate, you can write her. Thank you so much. I also want to thank, uh, along with, Ma, we're going to have a little video, right, Pablo? I'm going to shut up in just a second. I want to thank FACE, that's for Leader Lewis, ELL, Migrant, the Student Services, Bilingual School Counselors, School Health Nurses, Mental Health Services, Homeless Education Program, ESE, Child Finding Services. All these people were welcoming our Cuban families, and that's huge. So thank you, Miss Monica. Thank you, Larissa McCoy of Leto and that entire staff. Let's have a fun video. I, I have no, very little time left, uh, Pablo, so uh, hasten the pacing. George Lorenzo is ecstatic. Been an eight year process for them to immigrate. His niece, Gabriela Rodriguez, has been in Florida for about two weeks now. She just came here from Cuba. Now, she's getting her life in America figured out thanks to a program inside a portable on the backside of Lido High School. It's incredible what they're doing. Because for families in the area who need this kind of help, this immigrant welcome center set up by Hillsborough County Public Schools is helping newly immigrated students or families get their lives here started. We're hopeful to be just a, that beacon of hope and that beacon of support for them. So. And for Monica Vera Torado, that includes helping the families with initial registration to find out which school their child's going to or making sure they're up to date on any health needs and checking transcripts to make sure they're enrolled in the best courses for them. You know, they have a lot of questions and, and a lot of, um, th um, you know, challenges to the typical registration. So with school starting up in a couple days, they hope to reach as many families as they can before the new school year. We, we have an opportunity to pull together as a community, as a group, and really provide that extra layer of support and just help these kids and families. Having bilingual staff work with families has helped them better navigate these initial processes, and they say they can better help the students who are still learning English. It's something Lorenzo says will help his niece as she navigates her new life in Tampa. They just have so many programs available to help kids, and that's what it's all about. What they're doing here is 100% value. In Tampa, Nick Popham, Spectrum, Bay News 9. Okay, I'm on time. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that video, first of all. Thank you for sharing your stories of Cuba. I've also been to Cuba, Havana, and I felt the 
going back in time is a perfect explanation of what it feels like when you go there. Um, kind of to pivot a little bit, you know, I generally go out of my way to be positive in my board comments about our district and our collaboration and the hard work of all of the of our staff members. Um, however, we talk a lot about valuing our employees and the value, making sure that our teaching staff, our paras, everyone feels valued. And I can tell you that right now we've had a really rocky start to our teachers and our staff feeling valued. And it doesn't just come from constant talk about a livable wage, but it comes in a lot of other ways. And I can tell you that when teachers sit in 98 degree classrooms for five days on end, they don't feel valued. When they feel like their facilities aren't being prioritized, if they have leaky roofs or they feel like there's mold happening in their, in their classrooms, they don't feel prioritized. When they don't have the textbooks that they need in order to teach because their first evaluations are coming up, they don't feel valued and prioritized. When they don't have copy paper or things in lieu of that, they don't feel valued or prioritized. And I know a lot of these are things that are either out of our control because they're a workforce issue or they're things that don't come directly to us because maybe there's a manufacturer or there's a state uh, agency that gets Get something before we do. So what I think the disconnect is and what we need to work on as a district is communication. Because if there are barriers that are out of our control, our teachers and our staff need to understand that and they need to know that they are our priority and that's why we're working to address these issues and we do care about them and unfortunately they don't feel that way. A lot of service maintenance request orders, they feel like they've put in and they haven't gotten answers about or they've called about and they haven't gotten answers and they don't know when things are going to be fixed. If we have issues with books, instead of just sending out something to principals, making sure that our teachers understand what the challenges are and how we're setting up support systems to make sure that they can overcome those challenges should be a priority. So I would really like us as a board, as a district, I know we talk a lot about valuing the people in our in our schools and our classrooms to make sure that we're communicating when we have these challenges and barriers that they understand that it's our priority to take care of them, that we do understand that it's frustrating to try to teach in 98 degree weather when your kids can barely, you know, manage to to not die of a heat stroke, much less learn the curriculum that you want them to. So I think, again, communication and making sure, because we talk a lot about the district, what our obstacles are, but it is not trickling down to the people who are frustrated by it. And we have got to do a better job of communicating to make sure that they understand that we don't, we're doing everything we can to fix hot classrooms. We're doing everything to get them books. If not, we've created other ways for them to access learning things, or we will get them paper, or that any of those obstacles are a priority that we want to make sure that we um, address immediately to take care of them. So I just want to get that out there because that's some frustration that I've had. But other than that, I will say I wanted to share something positive. Um, you know, I've had a lot of transition in my district when it comes to administration and leadership, and there's been some bumpy rides. But I have gotten uh, quite a few emails about new leadership at Buchanan um, and that the culture and environment in that school is completely transforming and the staff really appreciate it and they're very happy so you know I really love to see something positive and I would love to to see what that administrator is doing as far as culture is concerned and climate because just that switch um, focusing on that has made such a huge impact there was one teacher who was on the brink of a mental health breakdown last year and I thought they were gonna leave teaching and just with this new administrator focusing on culture and climate and making them feel valued and making them feel supported they have a whole new attitude towards teaching so I would love to see that replicated and I think that's some positive movement um, and that's all I have hopefully uh, I'll have some more exciting stuff to share next time in board comments thank you thank you member Vaughn member Snively Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's plenty exciting for you you're to right, share in right, board right, comments. Yeah. So, um, so a couple things. I didn't know if um, you know there were a lot of there were a lot of a, a variety of comments that were that were brought forth t today um, from the public. And I don't necessarily want to put you on the spot, but there were some concerns that uh, I would like to hear your you address regarding um, a few of the items. Um, because even though we don't interact with the public, I think it's still important that you communicate um, what you can to, to let people know that if something is being worked on or taken care of. And so uh, the service animals issue, I'd like to hear about that. 
the um, district staff levels versus school personnel and what you're doing, you know, continuing to do about that. Um, the YMC, YMCA situation, if you can talk or if you know anything about what's going on there, the Sumner High School issue. Um, and again, if you don't have the information tonight, it's okay if, and you, I know you can only share a certain amount of information, but I want to at least assure people that we're not ignoring the public when they come to us and bring these, these issues. 99% uh, of the time, we are working with the people who are bringing those. Um, before that though, before, before you do that, um, I, this, I know this is going to continue to be an issue with the sexually explicit content of uh, books in our media center. I don't think that we're going to have any board meetings where someone's not going to be reading from a passage in a, in a book that was located in our media center. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to say thank you, and there's still one more thing I'm looking for on the one pager for our website. If a parent is concerned about the content, of a book that is in our media center, they can go to our um, media center what portion of our school website and there is directions on what to do. The one thing that's missing that was, um, that I was told would be on that page though, is the link, is the link to the request for reconsideration. It just says that you have to c take your complaint to the school's library media specialist, but then if further review is requested, the media specialist provides the request for reconsideration. And I just think that that should be available on the website because why do I need to go, go see the media specialist to get the form? Um, but that's just my, as a parent perspective, we're trying to limit some bureaucracy in the process. If it's truly um, a book that should be reviewed, we've heard a lot of content over the last several months. Some of it is absolutely disgusting. And I do believe that some of those books should not be in our media centers. But again, that's just my opinion. Um, it is the board's um, decision to keep or reject those, those books if it g comes to a point where um, the committee at each school decides to keep that book or can't make a decision on that particular content. So, um, you know, I do believe we should censure books in our media center to protect our children and the innocence of our children. Um, and we've got a lot of problems. I know we've talked about other issues in our schools, but if we can knock one out and make it a little bit more pleasant place to, to learn and, and ease our parents' concerns about some of the materials, then I think we should do that. So we got other other big problems to solve too, but that's one that to me that is a the alligator closest to the boat, low hanging fruit. So anyway, before thank you, Ma Member Snively. Uh, Mr. Porter okay. wanted to. Before sure. the superintendent responds, I just want to throw out a cautionary note. Public comment is an important part of your meetings, and there's a statement made at the beginning that the board and the superintendent and staff don't engage because it really isn't a dialogue. It's it's the public's opportunity to really express their opinion about. It's supposed to be about agenda items. But it can be, once we open it up, it can be about anything. And, and the superintendent can speak if he likes, but I think a better approach is to have him come back to you at a future date, either in writing or at a board meeting with responses, so that they are thoughtful and that all sides are considered and that he has an opportunity to really give you a meaningful um, response. And again, he can speak tonight, but the practice has been to, to be thoughtful about the response and not be reactive because he may or may not have all the information. If he tries to speak, it could not be a thoughtful response. It could put the district in some, in a position that's not the best position for the district to be in. So my recommendation would be, again, it's very important that if you feel like you need responses, that he come back to you with either a written response or at a board meeting or verbal responses, whatever makes sense. But I, I would just ask the board to, to be thoughtful about asking for responses to public comment at the same meeting, unless there's a really quick direct answer is something that needs to be corrected because it's wrong information. That's a judgment call. But you, if once you go down that path, board, it's really hard to go back from that path. And public comment sort of then becomes something that it wasn't intended to be. So that's just a cautionary note uh, to Ms. Nively's request. Well, I will say I would never ask the superintendent to speak on something that he could not be thoughtful about um, speaking. So don't 
you know, it's up to you. If you want to answer, you don't have to answer me. You can tell me to pound sand if you want to. So uh, speak to what you feel comfortable speaking towards. And if you don't feel comfortable speaking towards it, then don't. And if you want to get back to us one at a time, that's fine too. My uh, point of, that I was trying to make was that I just don't, I want people to understand that we are, we do work on some of the issues that are brought forth to us. And we, I don't want the, the implication or the perception that we're just sitting here not doing anything about what's happening out there or what they're feeling or what they're perceiving out there. Some of it, you know, there's three sides to every story. And so some of the information is not always 100% accurate. We understand that. But, I, you know, I'm only going to ask you to speak to what you're comfortable speaking about. Um, and if you're not, then don't. Yes, Mr. The Chair. Yes, Mr. The Chair, we have, uh, on, on the majority of those issues, I've had staff engaged. This evening, staff has been engaged prior. And to your point, we are definitely taking every one of these uh, viewpoints uh, very serious. And as you see, staff members will start to bridge out. If I look at them, get the nod, or they take proactive steps to do it. But we're engaged in many different levels related to, you know, Mr. Gibson is doing a really good job with the, any particular service for risk management and being able to make certain that uh, Mike McManus is engaged with YMCA and any after school, before school programs. He's engaged with that, with that particular parent and then continued with any other elements. So we are continuous if there's any um, issues that uh, I believe that are, uh, need to be escalated to the board, I promise I will engage. And then please, if you hear issues that tonight that you think that you want deeper, let me know and I'll provide that information. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Snelly, you're done? That is. Thank you. Um, just a couple comments. Just this week I met um, with our library science, Mr. Fusco, and you know, people are calling us from around the country and throughout the district asking what we did, what is working, because there's many districts where they started banning books and now there's a hundred books behind there, or a child gets a book and there's lawsuits. Districts around the state are calling us because what we have done is we are following what the National Library Association recommends and what Hillsborough County does is if you would like to take a book out of a school, then you go through the process. The idea of banning books, just the other night, you know, I had a 19, my 19-year-old was listening to really loud rap music and I sat there and I thought, Wow. You know, I mean, he, he could hunt through a book for a sentence, but all he has to do is put on his AirPod. And as kids walk around school with AirPods, where you see seven and eight year olds have phones in their hands, where they can download any book, any website. And you talk about meeting and grooming. When you see people who are meeting someone, they're accessing that through the phone. So I just want to say that liability wise, when you see I don't want to name the districts, the surrounding districts have called us and said, we have now opened a can of worms, and how do we now go back and change that? So we are doing with the National Library Association, we are following the guidelines by DeSantis, we are following all of those laws, so I think that's really important that we don't continue to provide misinformation regarding that. Also, I just want to say I want to thank Mr. Connor and Superintendent Davis for how hard we worked on the referendum. To say that um, I was hard on the millage, um, you know, to st increase the millage, to say that it was heartbreaking is an understatement. You know, I know that there's multiple reasons why it failed, but at the end of the day, we just need to continue to work harder, continue to build trust, continue to be financially stable, and continue to work with our district to do what's best for, for our, our community and our schools. I mean, to see these teachers here today and to see these emails, it is by far, sitting here is the hardest job every day to see what's happening. When you go out to schools and you see the number of students that, that teachers are, are working with, when we see where we're deploying people, we're doing everything we can, and the challenges are, are so large, and we will continue to work hard. You know, um, last week was a horrible week. This is a new week, and we just need to continue working for what we're here for every day, and that's our students. I appreciate Superintendent Davis, you creating the Teacher Advisory Board. I think that's really one of the first steps. Um, Member Gray and I attended that meeting, and you had teachers from all levels, virtual, really talking about what we can do to con continue to improve the morale in our district. You know, obviously, financially, that's going to be really important, 
but also we need to continue to try to improve teacher morale. Um, there's so many wonderful things happening in our district. Um, I want to thank Melissa Morgado this morning for expanding um, the dual language program at Woodbridge Elementary. It was so exciting to see all these kindergarten students and to see how many community members came out there at Woodbridge. It was amazing. The library was filled and we are just seeing so many of our principals, administrators, faculty and staff working so hard for that. I also wanted to take a moment um, you know, when I first came here, you know, I, there were a lot of things I wanted to drill more, you know, multiplication, addition, subtraction. I wanted to really push towards early learning, CTE programs. And one of the things that I talked to Daniela Simic um, and Angela Schroden is about starting like a learning letters because we do find kids who are in second grade that still don't know their sounds um, and we do so many different things so i want to thank amanda osario lisa haynes and stephanie lobel and rhonda mort for having this vision and then creating something that was so much larger than i ever imagined so i wanted to share this short video with you as we close um, talking about learning letters and just really trying to spread that out into our community and trying to spread literacy and the importance of uh, early learning for our students. So Pablo, if you'll just... So the reason we created Learning Letters for Hillsborough County Public Schools is because while there are other programs out there like Romper Room and Sesame Street, there was nothing local to our students and families in Hillsborough County. We wanted to make learning engaging and rigorous and all-encompassing, but we wanted to do it with local restaurants and businesses and venues so that students really felt a sense of home and belonging. The kids at James were dancing and singing along. It's just like Jack Hartman to them, right? They are very interested in the graphics, in the read-alouds, in the lessons some of them are able to learn the sign language to do the letters so they were very excited because it's also something they've never seen before it's new it's shiny and how many times have you heard there's only so many ways to teach the letter a well here's another way for you welcome to this episode of learning letters with Hillsborough County Public Schools I am Miss Lisa and this is Miss Rhonda and we are so excited to help you become an amazing reader and writer. Come along and learn with us. Miss Stephanie, show us what letter we're going to explore today. <laughs> today we are going to be learning the letter A. We are going to do many things with the letter A today. Our objective is how can I identify the letters of the alphabet? I can identify the characteristics of upper and lower case A. I will know I have it when I can correctly name the letter, write the letter, find the letter, do examples and non-examples, and be able to find that letter in various words. I'm so excited. We have a lot to do. Thank you, and I hope everybody has an e a nice evening. This meeting is adjourned.